Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Levasseur. So today we're moving into part three of the West Memphis Three series. And I guess we're, you know, kind of keeping the theme of three because today we're focusing our episode on the three suspects that would be arrested for the the murders of these eight-year-old boys. We've got Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, Jesse, Ms. Kelly Jr., and that is who we are talking about today. Basically, I think because we're going in depth on this case, it's important to know and understand who these three suspects were. It's important to give all the information available, not just the information that supports whatever side of the story is being told or what are, whatever narrative is being upheld. And in order to do this, I have turned to several sources to piece together what I hope to be you know, a thorough and unbiased view of all three teenage boys who were arrested and put on trial for the murder of eight-year-old Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore. And the sources that I used for this episode were the autobiography of Damian Eccles. It's called Life After Death, as well as the book that's called The Case Against the West Memphis Three by Gary Meese, and also the book Devils Not by Mara Leverett, as well as obviously internet resources, Damian Eccles' medical history, uh, his interactions with law enforcement, things like that. And all of the sources that I used were both in support of the three teenagers and against them. So I tried to, you know, get a good sprinkling of different viewpoints in there in order to put this together. And hopefully I, I did all right. <laughs> I'm sure you did. And I'm glad we're we're going from both sides of it. Uh, there have been some comments. And when I say that, I always say it as if like, it's not the majority, but you have, we have new subscribers every single week and people who tune into specific series that we do because they have a personal uh, interest in that particular case and they may feel like they know everything about it and they want to hear what we have to say. Um, I don't know if this needs to be said, but I guess I'll say it for some of our newer listeners or, or watchers. Uh, Stephanie and I don't pull punches. Uh, if we, we don't care what the popular narrative is, I think we proved that multiple times, but in more recent history, Adnan Syed, we both said that even though he's out as a free man, it's still highly likely that he is somehow involved with Heyman Lee's death. I mean, that's not necessarily the popular opinion, but that's what we said. And we got we got we got shit for that and we don't care. Well, we got some we got some heat for we that. We got some heat for that, but we we try to be honest with you and regardless of whatever the popular opinion is, whatever like people are making money off of. I know for me personally, the whole way I got into true crime was doing a special about OJ where a guy, a guy by the name of Pildy, Bill Deere, who was a private investigator, made millions off his book about OJ's son, Jason, being the person who killed Nicole Brown Simpson. And I flew out to LA and I believe disproved his theory and told him that directly to his face. And that was my first show. So I could have easily like killed my career by doing it, but I don't think we have a history of just going with the popular narrative. So some people in the comments have said, you know, oh, I can already see where they're going. They're going to, they're already leaning towards someone else and that the West Memphis three didn't actually do it. And there's people who believe they did. And so just to put it out there, and I, I think I can speak for you, Stephanie, where if we believe that these individuals are somehow involved, even though they're currently out as free people, our opinion is just our opinion. It doesn't mean they are, but we will never shy away from that. And I, if I feel at the end of this that they are still good for this crime, regardless of the fact that they're out there, I'll say I don't care who in the space has already covered it one way and feels a certain way, who is backing them as far in, as far as them being unjustly arrested in the first place. I don't care. I don't I think that's the good thing about this channel is I'm learning about these cases with you. So we're going through the emotions and the feelings and the the process of figuring out the case where it may feel like I'm leaning one way like you guys are in episodes one and two, and then episodes three and four, we all change together or a majority of us do because of the facts being put out there. But we gotta be allowed to go through that process. We're not coming into it with preconceived notions. And at the end, we're gonna call it how we see it. Some of you will agree with us, some of you won't. But we're going to just be honest with you and you can take that for what it is and i can tell you what it is it's a pin it's opinion and everybody has one 
doesn't make ours more right than the next person. But if you're coming here to listen to us, obviously you're interested in our opinions. So we'll be, we'll be transparent and we'll go from there. We're not leaning one way or the other. We'll just see how it goes. I mean, I'm not even going to say that I don't come into these, some of these cases with preconceived Well, yeah, you notions. do. You're the storyteller. I think that's fair. I do, of course. Come and in you've, you've researched notions. them before and covered them before. You're already, you've already gone through your process. But even, even then I still find myself changing, you know? Like it happened with the Michael Peterson case, sort of, when we were going over that the That is staircase. true. It did. You're right. Because you were more convinced uh, that he might be innocent at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? That's right. I do remember that. So I I definitely, like, I'm a, I'm a human being. So I'm going to have, like, biases. Like every single other human being that walks this earth, not one of you is free of that. But um, I, I also, like, am really open and I'm not, I'm, I don't live in an echo chamber and I don't like people who do and I don't like generalities. So I will always, like, look at everything that's put in front of me. And I, I go deeper with these cases with Crime Weekly than I ever did on, on YouTube, especially in the beginning, because we have more time and we have more, you know, freedom and flexibility to do that. So it's always going to change. But I think it's a little, you know, redundant to to assume or reductive to assume that we just you know which way we're going after like yeah. one episode that's dumb <laughs> you know it's like watching a movie and you're like oh i already know where this is going well they hit you with a twist you know at the end like you think you know where it's going but they they hit you with a twist so just sit down strap yeah. in get a snack enjoy the ride and follow right. along if, what's the and, saying and you trust the process what's the saying I don't know. it's the it's not always the destination it's the journey right it's the, it journey, the journey of getting there yeah so enjoy the journey. It's not yeah. only about the destination. We'll you get gotta there. You got to think about where we're going with it or what we're doing or if we have a narrative. We don't got no narrative. Just get that yeah. out of your head right away. Not, not me and Derek, we don't have any narrative. We don't owe anything to anyone and we don't feel like we do at all. I was standing 10 feet away from this person, one of these individuals, like you had said, at the, at the, at the bar that night at CrimeCon. Mm -hmm. I have no skin in the game. I don't, I have, I don't love this person or hate them. I don't care either way. I just look at what I'm being shown and listen to the facts and come up with my own opinion. And you could have seven other cops look at it and feel completely different, differently about it. It's just, just one opinion. Yeah. So, I mean, let's do this. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. So in order to talk about Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse, Ms. Kelly Jr., I think we first have to touch a little bit on Jerry Driver the man who first put these three teenage boys on the radar of law enforcement. Now, Jerry Driver had originally worked as a commercial airline pilot before he kind of retired, and then he and his wife had tried their hand at opening their own business. It was a cleaning service. That business failed, and then Jerry, sort of like as a last resort, took a job as a Crittenden County juvenile probation officer, and he was um, in his 50s when he took this job. And in 1993, Jerry Driver was the county's chief juvenile officer, and his assistant was Steve Jones. We've already talked a little bit about Steve Jones. He was the man who had spotted the floating tennis shoe that led the police to the location of the missing boys' bodies. So the day after the bodies were found, Steve Jones had a conversation with Lieutenant James Sudbury of the West Memphis Police. Now remember, Sudbury was one of the police officers who at that time was being investigated by the state police for corruption. Remember, he had admitted to like taking guns and stuff out of evidence. And he's like, we all do it. Like, what's the problem with it? We don't understand. And then Sudbury and a couple of his colleagues, you know, got caught up in this. But, you know, a judge ended up not pressing any charges against them and kind of not pushing anything with it and nothing happened to them. But in his report, Lieutenant Sudbury writes, quote, on the day after the bodies of the three boys were found, I had a conversation with Steve Jones, a juvenile officer for Crittenden County, Arkansas. In our conversation, I found that Steve and I shared the same opinion, that the murders appeared to have overtones of cult sacrifice. During our conversation, Steve mentioned that all of the people known by him to be involved in cult-type activities, one person stood out in his mind that, in his opinion, was capable of being involved in this type of crime. That person was Damian Eccles, end quote. 
And even though Lieutenant Sudbury was on narcotics, he usually worked drug cases, and even though Steve Jones was a probation officer who had no law enforcement training, the two men decided to join forces and work the angle that the murders were cult-related and that Damien Eccles was involved. And Sudbury asked Jones to meet him that same day at Damien's home, which was located at the Lakeshore Estates Trailer Park in Marion. So Sudbury claims in his report that he received permission from Damien's mother and stepfather to interview Damien. That that wasn't actually true at all (laughs) because he gives the complete wrong names in the report. And I don't even think at this point Damien's mother was living there. I think Damien was living with his stepfather. But either way, he gives completely wrong names in the report. But according to Lieutenant Sudbury, this initial interview happened in Damien's bedroom. And Sudbury's report, it gives no indication of what questions he asked Damien or what Damien's responses were. But the police officer does note that, you know, Damien was kind of wearing like dark clothes and he kind of talked about what he looked like, stating, quote, At this time, I observed Damien to have a tattoo on his chest of a five-pointed star or a pentagram as best as I remember one other tattoo on his shoulder or arm. I'm unsure of the nature of this tattoo, end quote. And Steve Jones, the parole officer, who's also the probation officer, I suppose I should call him, who was also there, he noted that two pairs of Damien's shoes, tennis shoes and boots, had mud caked on the bottoms. But at that time, the shoes were not taken into evidence. Now, in his book, Life After Death, Damien claims that Sudbury did not stay on topic about the murders. In fact, it wasn't even really Sudbury who was doing the talking. Damien claims that it was mainly Steve Jones who was asking Damien seemingly random questions. Like, at first, you know, who's your favorite author? What's your favorite book of the Bible? And then he kind of like went into the deeper questions and he was like, have you ever read anything by Anton LaVey? And Anton LaVey is a figure who was kind of like the head of the the Church of Satan and all of this stuff. So that you kind of know the vein that they're going with with these questions. And eventually Damien was asked if he knew anything about devil worshiping in the area or if he'd been made aware of any plans to sacrifice children, which is a completely normal question that you'd be asked during a police interview, you know? I will say, without knowing all of Steve's background, the questioning, the, that style, I think I've mentioned it here before, that is pretty pretty normal, where you want to start with more non-threatening questions that can also be referred to as control questions, where there's no reason for the person you're interviewing to lie. They're just mm-hmm. normally, what's your favorite Reds, you know, baseball team? You know, where did you grow up? Things like that. And what you're trying to do now, maybe Steve wasn't doing this. He could just be asking those questions to try to soften him up a little bit before he gets into the hard hitting questions. But what he should be doing at this point is asking those questions and being concerned with the answers. Obviously, you want to be engaged, but more so noting the physical behavior of the person of Damien while you're speaking with him as he's answering those questions. Is he bladed towards you? Is his shoulders back? Is his arms open? Is he tapping his hand or feet? Is he doing anything that's of worth noting in your mind? The reason you do that is so that when you ask those harder hitting questions, you can know if that behavior or his demeanor changes during those questions. Not a guarantee that he's, it's a, that he's lying at that point, but it can sometimes suggest a sign of deception or a sign of being uh, anxious about the questions being asked. And and that's how you go back and forth between control questions and then questions that could be incriminating to see if the, the new behavior you're observing is something you only observe when asking those hard hitting questions, right? You can go back and hit them with some more softball questions to see if the tapping of the leg or the tapping of the hands stops during those questions because this is a subconscious response. In most cases, they don't even know they're doing it. So like ask easy questions to get a baseline and then see what happens when you start asking more intense questions. I right. don't think he was doing that. I think Probably he was, not. That's why I prefaced yeah. it. <laughs> I think he was trying to be like like non-assuming because Damien said he kind of came in and he was like, we need your help with something, you know, kind of right. like this. Uh, you know, we're on the same side and like, let's let's talk about, hey, have you heard about any plans to sacrifice children? Like, what? You know? right. so um, I think that he's probably just trying to like make him feel safe and like let yeah. his guard down. Yeah, which is which is part of it, which right. is part of it. You want to have them feel comfortable and feel like they're helping you so that they may say something that may bring you to another question that could get you down a road. But 
yeah, who knows what, doesn't seem like the setting that you would do it in necessarily, but I'd be lying if I said I haven't had these more informal interviews at individuals' homes where you don't really know what you have, but based on these these interactions, you may start to feel like, hmm, they really were giving us a lot of indicators. There's like 20 different indicators to look for, and they hit like 12 of them. Well, now, even though you may not have something tangible to make an arrest or anything, it's just someone you might want to look into deeper based on how they behave during that initial interaction. Yeah, well, Damien said, quote, before leaving, they took a Polaroid picture of me. Later, I found out that they showed it to nearly everyone in town, using it to plant the ideas in the minds of an already frightened public. In court, they denied taking the picture or even coming to see me that day. They had to because Jones and Driver were from different offices and weren't supposed to be involved in the investigation in any way, end quote. So I did a little fact checking on this in Sudbury's report, it does say that he took a picture of Damien. But during the trial, they did say that they didn't do that. So that's interesting. And I also kind of wanted to see if there was any uh, like eyewitness statements or testimony, like aside from Damien, of people who remembered law enforcement or Jerry Driver or Steve Jones or Lieutenant Sudbury showing Damien's picture around town. And there were. So there were people that said, um, in the days and the weeks following uh, these murders of these three boys that the police were like showing Damien's picture around town and saying like, oh, do you know if he's into anything weird? Like, is he, is he into occult stuff, blah, blah, blah. And like just in general, by default, that is going to start planting ideas in people's minds. And then you wonder why after this you have a rash of people coming forward and being like, I saw black hooded figures walking towards the forest with candles in their hands, or I saw a dead dog with his entrails pulled out and and it was Damien who did it because I heard from my friend that Damien takes dogs and pulls their insides out to sacrifice them to the devil when nobody was getting those reports before that or giving them before that. But once you start like bringing this picture around and you're like, ah, do you know if this guy worships the devil? Do you know if he's into occult stuff? Right after these three little boys are found dead and the paper's reporting that like it seems, you know, like they were mutilated and things like that, like people are going to put stuff together in their heads even if they don't know that they're doing it. So was it wrong for them to do that? Was it right? I would say it's probably wrong. Also, I'm not going to say they were nefarious about it. I'm not going to say that was their intent. I think their intent was to try to get information because, yo, these these men, like Jerry Driver and Steve Jones especially, legitimately believed there was like a cult worshiping, devil worshiping going on in West Memphis. So I think that they thought they were doing the right thing. Like if there's all of this stuff going on, Somebody has to know about it. And if we ask enough people about it, we'll get something. And they did get something. But did they get something true? I don't know. And also, I think it is interesting that Damien says they were from different offices, so they shouldn't have been involved in the investigation. I don't know if it's like they shouldn't have been involved or if they were not. They weren't like sort of officially involved, if it makes sense. They kind of just took it upon themselves as officers of the law in some capacity to to go and question Damien yeah. and to continue questioning Damien, Damien and Jason and Jesse. Is that normal for a small town? I don't know. I don't think it's normal for for like regular, you know, city sized police departments. I think you probably have specialized people who do specialized things, but I don't know how it is in like a small place like West Memphis. Yeah, I would like to think that's not the way it works because you want to make sure that there's some type of collaborative effort. There's a cohesiveness within the investigation where the department has a plan of attack, how they're going to do this and making sure that the information that any investigator receives is sent back to the mothership, right? So that everybody, even though they may not be conducting that interview, is getting the same information related to them. So there's not these tentacles going off, kind of doing their own thing, having this lateral investigation that maybe the detectives who are actually assigned to the case don't even know about. Uh, you You could taint the investigation, which back on to what you just said, that's absolutely the case here. When you start basically everything you said, when you start to have all these conversations happening amongst the community, and then even if you're just showing the picture without any context, which Mm -hmm. probably wasn't the case, but even if you're just showing the picture, you're tainting that that community and, and you're tainting your pool of witnesses because they are organically going to start to ask themselves, 
why are they showing me this specific picture? They have to be somehow involved with this case. So now they're going to start to view that person in a different light and it can, it can taint their judgment. That's also why when you do a photo lineup, we as detectives cannot go into a room with a witness and show them one photo and say, Hey, is this the person that you saw that day? It's inadmissible in court. We have to go create what's called the six pack or even an eight pack where you have you know, if you have one person that you're looking to see if they're involved, you have to have five at minimum five other individuals that have similar characteristics to that person so that when you show the witness, if they're able to identify them out of a lineup, it can now be used. If you show them a photo of that person before the lineup, the lineup's never going to fly in court. So this in a way is kind of like doing that where if down the road you want to do something with Damien Eccles that person has to first be asked were they ever shown a photo of Damien in the past? And if that's the case, well, then you can't use it. And this is why having investigators or people in law enforcement doing their own thing, it could actually hurt the main investigator, it could actually hurt the main detective. So I don't really like it, especially if it wasn't uh, approved by whoever was in charge of this investigation. It doesn't seem like it was. And it absolutely could hurt the case going forward. It was Gary Getchell, right? Which is something I, I wrote his name down so I wouldn't forget to mention that. But he was the lead investigator. And there's no sign or at least a paper trail of Gary Getchell being like, hey, Lieutenant Sudbury, uh, Steve Jones, you guys go and, and talk to Damien. It just seemed like Steve and Lieutenant Sudbury got together and they were like, this got we're devil, this got some devil sent to it, you know, and then they like went over to Damien's house. So that's, yeah, can't that's a problem. Can't and happen. Great point with the photo lineup. Like, I didn't even think about that, but that makes complete sense. You're, yeah. you're suggesting to somebody already that this person's involved, even if you don't tell them what, what they're looking at them for, which once again, doesn't seem like that's what happened. Like, they definitely showed the pictures and were like, do you know if these, this kid's like devil worshiping? Of course they did. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Who doesn't want to make mealtime easier or prepare restaurant quality meals made with fresh, wholesome ingredients that you can prepare quickly and from the comfort of your own home? HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable, delivering fresh, pre-measured ingredients from mouth-watering seasonal recipes right to your door, which means less time in the grocery store, and it also means cutting out stressful meal planning. With the cost of groceries going up every day, now is the perfect time to get started with HelloFresh because using HelloFresh HelloFresh is 70% less expensive than going out to eat at a restaurant. And one of my favorite parts about HelloFresh is that they give you exactly what you need and only what you need to create each recipe. The seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness for quality and taste, and they get from the farm to your house in less than seven days, and you'll get exactly the right amount for the recipe that you're making, which means less food waste and less of your money going in the garbage. And each recipe comes with a handy and easy-to-follow recipe card with step-by-step -step instructions and pictures making it pretty much impossible to mess up even if you don't think that you're normally a good cook. You'd be surprised what you can whip up with HelloFresh. I love that HelloFresh has 40 weekly recipes to choose from for all meal occasions, lifestyles, and preferences. I would like to take a moment and rave about one of their new recipes that I tried. It's the mushroom and chive risotto. I love risotto. It was so, so good. I was surprised at how good it was because I'm very picky about risotto, but it was excellent. I'll also say that now that I've been working out more, doing more weight training, I've been struggling to get in my protein because I don't eat a lot throughout the day. But powering up with protein is easier than ever with HelloFresh. They actually have a protein smart tag on their menu so you can quickly and easily find meals that have 30 grams of protein or more like their creamy Dijon dill chicken or their one pot pork and black bean chili. And this has really helped me because I'm able to sort of just like prepare one meal that's meant for four people all at once and then I just keep it in the refrigerator and pull out portions as I need it. There's really just so much to love about HelloFresh. I could keep talking but I won't because I want to let Derek tell you how you can start cooking with HelloFresh today. That's right. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeWeekly60 and use our code CrimeWeekly60 for 60% off plus free shipping. One more time, that's HelloFresh.com slash CrimeWeekly60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Check them out, guys. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit.
Okay, we're back. So police in the area had also received a report on May 7th from a man named Dennis Ingle. So May 7th was the day after the boys' bodies were found, and it was also the same day that um, Steve Jones and Lieutenant Sudbury were going and questioning Damien and then taking his Polaroid and showing it around town. So Dennis Ingle was the pastor at the Lakeshore Baptist Church, and Ingalls claimed that he heard there was some devil worshiping going on at Lakeshore Trailer Park. So Lakeshore Trailer Park is where a bunch of people involved in this case live. Jason Baldwin lives there. Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. lived there. And Damien lived there, as well as Damien's then girlfriend, Dominique Tier. So it's kind of like they, they're all living in the same location, in the same area. And two days later, on May 9th, Ingalls told police officer Shane Griffin, who's another narcotics officer, that Damien Eccles was known to hang around the trailer park and he was involved with a cult, a cult that was supposedly said to meet somewhere around the Mississippi River. Now, Ingalls also said that he'd personally seen Damien wearing boots with the numbers 666 on them. And Damien had a girlfriend named Dominique Tier who lived in the trailer park. So on May 9th, Jerry Driver was talking to Lieutenant Sudbury, and they're talking about, you know, devil worshiping and the occult and all this stuff. And Jerry Driver was like, here. I made a list of nine names of people that I definitely think are involved in this devil worshiping cult. And of course, who was on the list? Well, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., Dominique Tier as well, probably just because she was Damian's girlfriend and they all kind of hung out together. So this list prompted Shane Griffin, Officer Shane Griffin, to grab Detective Bill Durham, who was with the West Memphis Police Department. He was actually their polygraph expert. And they drove over to the home of Jason. Jason Baldwin to interview him. And at their pleasant surprise, when they knocked on the door, they found that not only was Jason at home, but he was in the company of Damien Eccles and Damien's girlfriend, Domini Tier. Now, that same day, a resident of West Memphis, Arkansas named Narlene Hollingsworth told police that she'd seen Damien Eccles on May 5th. Remember, that's the day that these three little boys had gone missing. She said he'd been in the company of his girlfriend, Domini, and they'd been leaving Robin Hood Hills wearing muddy clothes. Once again, this is May 9th, four days later, after they've been showing his picture around after gossip starting to spread. Narlene Hollingsworth ain't had shit to say before that. And you'd think you'd remember that, you know, t- three little boys go missing, their bodies are found in Robin Hood Hills. You'd think you'd be like, oh, Shit, didn't I see Damien and Dominique coming out of Robin Hood Hills all muddy that day? The same day the boys went missing and, you know, allegedly were killed? I should tell the police. No, she doesn't say anything until these rumors about devil worshiping and Damien being involved with the occult, this, this and that are starting to spread around town, which it's a small town. They're, you know, super religious, Bible thumping, et cetera, et cetera. And so word of anything like this is spreading literally like wildfire, like very quickly. Would have been great to know. We won't know now, but if but if Narlene was shown this photo as well before she came forward, was did anybody approach her with a photo or did she hear anything about Damien Eccles or any of the other people before coming forward? Or is this just completely out of the blue where she just came forward with this information without any knowledge that law enforcement or, or affiliates of law enforcement were going around asking about specific people like Damien Eccles. No, she had knowledge of it. Yes, for sure. She had knowledge. Okay, well, Mm -hmm. then there you go. That's exactly what we're we're fearful of here when you're trying to be impartial. Yeah, well, there was very little impartiality happening here. And, you know, this is another reason why. Like, for the people who, who believe that these three teenagers are guilty, and who knows, you might be right. The fact of the matter is, this was handled so disgustingly badly by every single adult involved from law enforcement to the parents of these kids like it was handled so poorly that you you will never know because once this once this case got to like an impartial judge outside of West Memphis and once it was like actually looked at objectively without bias any normal person was like holy shit this was a witch hunt You could have found physical evidence. You could have found all of that stuff if you'd done a proper investigation. But instead, you literally went on a witch hunt. And so the the evidence you came back with and brought to court was crazy, (laughs) you know? So instead of actually doing forensics and trying to get DNA and like tracking fibers and things like that, 
they were over here trying to find out where like the witch meeting was happening and stuff like that. So yeah, I I agree that it, it's unfortunate because am I going to say 100% like they're not involved? No, I'm not even there yet. But if they were involved, there's no way to prove that now because of how it was handled because of bias because of, you know, what is it called when you have like this this fear of something and it's like superstition and just kind of ignorance really in general it's ignorance like i'm not saying people aren't devil worshiping out there but i'm saying if you're gonna say that somebody's in a cult and devil worshiping and like you know making sacrifices to satan in the form of three eight-year-old boys you better come correct with a lot of physical evidence to back that up because the whole theory in itself is ludicrous. <laughs> so you've got to really have good supporting evidence, not just circumstantial, not that they even really had circumstantial evidence, but physical evidence as well. And that didn't happen. Yeah. Nope. I agree with you. And it's one of those things where we said it last episode where the reverse engineering the case from the suspects that they had already had already came to the conclusion it was them. Now it was like, okay, how do we tie them back to this crime? That's not the way it works. It works the opposite direction. And as far as what you just said a couple minutes ago as to whether or not they're guilty or not guilty, I think it's similar with that not. And I'm not saying that's the case here. I will tell you, as I said at the beginning of this episode, at the end, how I feel. But there are two different things going on here. Yes, we want innocent people to be cleared of any wrongdoing in, in a case like this. It's important to find out who did it. It's also to, important to find that exculpatory evidence that rules people out so you can take them off the list. So there are situations where you have had individuals who are arrested and charged and convicted of crimes they didn't commit. We already know that to be true and it should never happen, but it does. We also have cases where individuals have committed the crime and unfortunately due to the lack of evidence or just police misconduct and their inability to process a case correctly, they go free. That sucks, but it does happen. And we'd rather see that happen than, than have the opposite, the latter, which I just discussed. But I think it's important to note that there are people out there, in my again, my opinion, OJ Simpson being one of them, after looking into that case extensively, who have committed two murders like OJ, and are walking amongst us as a free person, even though they went to prison for a completely separate crime. And then, by the way, wrote a book about his innocence. So none of that really means much to me because I absolutely think OJ killed those two people. But just to say this does happen. So that's why we're coming into this with an open mind. Damien Eccles, Jason Baldwin, Jesse, Miss Kelly, we may conclude at the end of this that they should have never been charged in the first place doesn't mean we believe they're innocent of the crime. We'll get there. It's going to take a while, but that's why there's a couple different things going on here. You can say, hey, they don't deserve to be in prison, but they may have been involved. That's okay. That just means that it should have went down like that initially. They never should have been arrested in the first place. So, Or or there should have been an, you know, an actual police investigation done the actual way. Right. right? And, and here's yeah. the thing. Sometimes, even if the investigation is done the right way, if the, if the criminal gets lucky or they just are very good at what they do. There may be situations, this is a hard pill to swallow, where there's just not enough near, there to charge them. Mm -hmm. And it's not our jobs as the detectives to fill in those blanks with our own evidence. That's where it gets very, very bad for investigations going forward because police officers can only go with what they have, not with what they know. And that is a situation where sometimes you may know who did it. But unfortunately, the evidence is not there to support it. And that's why we have a justice system. That's why everyone has a right to due process and you go to court and you let an impartial jury decide whether the detective is right and they do have enough or they don't. So without going too much on a tangent there, that's, again, just to cover what we're dealing with here. Because I know these three individuals are out and about right now and some people are like, oh, they did it. I don't know why we, you know, why we're even talking about it. Well, we'll see. We'll Nobody we'll said see. that. Somebody literally said they did it. I don't know why we're talking about this. Maybe not those words, but there's absolutely a, a, a good amount of comments that believe that they are guilty of this crime. I know that there's people that, that believe yeah. they're guilty. I still yeah. have a one crazy asshole sending me threatening messages from literally years ago when I did the first series. Like yeah. he's a crazy person and every once in a while, every couple of months he pops up and he's like, you're going to hell you stupid bitch and like this, this and that. So for helping the devils and all of this, like I get it. I know some people think that they're guilty, but I don't. People were triggered by your initial monologue. 
It was, it, you, you had a very great uh, polarizing monologue. It's one of your best monologues. And I agree with this, by the way, it was one of your best monologues you've ever done. A lot of comments about how you just crushed the trailer that we always do at the beginning of a series. But there were some people who took one sentence that you said, and I don't quote me on this, but it was like six lives forever changed or changed or whatever. And people are like, Oh, she's already going with that. You know? Uh. Yeah. So that was the, that was the, the trigger sentence, but yeah, I know we're going off the path here. I'm sorry. We'll get triggered by a sentence. Imagine. I can't (laughs) even, I can't, I can't relate. Can't relate. Mm. Um, Yeah. I also think once you muddy the waters of an investigation like this, there's no going back. You know, it's it's like once it's tainted yep. and once it becomes, can't it. yeah, you can't, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You know, you can't clear that, that water up again to see things the way they are. So that that's what happened. And like, so if you want to be mad at somebody that these three guys got away, if you think they're guilty, then be mad at the West Memphis Police Department and Jerry Driver and Steve Jones and every other idiot who ran around chasing witches. Okay. Be mad <sighs> at them. So according to Damien, after this first visit to his house and then when the police talked to him again at Jason's house, the visits from the police were nonstop. He said, quote, they were soon coming at me every single day. They came to my parents' house, to Dominie's trailer and to Jason's house. It wasn't always the same, too. There was a rotating crew of about six of them. It was the same questions day after day. It became pretty apparent that these clowns weren't looking for a murderer Jerry Driver and his two cohorts put a bug in the ear of the West Memphis Police Department and they couldn't shake it. Instead of conducting a real murder investigation and checking the forensic evidence, the police started immediately chasing stories of black-robed figures that danced around bonfires and chanted demonic incantations. End quote. But why? Right? That's the question. Why of all the kids in West Memphis did Jerry Driver, Steve Jones, and the West Memphis Police Department focus so heavily on Damian Eccles and as a result on his friends, right? Because that's really what happened here. If it if it hadn't been for Damien, I truly believe that Jason Baldwin and Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. would have never come on their radar. Nobody ever would have looked at them for this. It just so happened that they were focused on Damien and because Jason was Damien's best friend and Jesse was known to hang out with them, uh, they just kind of got like thrown into the mix because you can't have a cult with just one person, right? You just can't do it. I mean, a lonely cult. People have tried, but if you don't have followers, you don't have a cult. So why did they focus on Damien? Let's talk about that. In order to understand all of that, we have to go back to the beginning and we're going back to Damien's mother, Pamela. She was the product of an affair that her father had. She ended up being adopted and later she went on to struggle throughout life with reports of bizarre behavior throughout middle school and high school. Pam would later drop out of school due to mental issues, at which point she had to receive psychiatric treatment. When she was just 15, Pam married Joe Hutchinson. And on December 11, 1974, at the Crittenden County Hospital in West Memphis, Arkansas, they welcomed their son into the world. Now, Pam and Joe named him Michael Wayne Hutchison, and many years later, this little baby would grow up and change his name to Damien. And everyone was like, he changed his name to Damien because that's an evil name. You know, like the Omen kid, you know, that little creepy kid, Damien the Omen. Not according to Damien, he was actually, you know, had always kind of gone through, I mean, he went through a lot, like whether you want to hate him or not like if you look at his childhood which is not just his narrative it's like a very clear and and real narrative of what happened it's not just his his story and what he says he went through a lot and as a result he didn't really know who he was he had to find himself he went through like a bunch of different religions he did go and get baptized in like a, a christian church and he kind of was attending like catholic mass which apparently according to him was a little taboo to be like a Catholic in West Memphis because I guess everybody was, um, I forget what it was. You know, it's like a branch of Christianity, but being a Catholic was kind of like looked down upon. And so he went to Catholic mass and he got baptized. And one of the saints that he really kind of admired and respected was named Damien. So he decided to change his name to Damien. That's what he says. So according to the book, The Case Against the West Memphis Three, Damien was a challenge even as a baby. He began troubling behaviors such as banging his head against the walls and floors repeatedly. And Pamela, his mother, would go on to have a miscarriage before giving birth to Damien's little sister, Michelle. 
But when she had two children, Pam decided that caring for both Damien and Michelle was too much for her. So Damien was sent to live with his grandmother, Frances Gosa, who is a woman that he called Nanny. And at that time, she lived in Senatobia, Mississippi. Now, first of all, Damien writes in his book about being a little bit resentful that his sister Michelle was born across the bridge in Memphis, Tennessee, whereas he was born in West Memphis. He felt that it should have been him who was born in Memphis. And he said, quote, in my youth, Memphis always felt like home to me. When we crossed the bridge into Tennessee, I had the sensation of being where I belonged and thought it only right that I should have been the one born there, end quote. And maybe Damien was also a little resentful that when his mother couldn't cope with the stresses of being a parent, he was the one who got sent away. Dr. George Woods, a psychiatrist from Berkeley, California, who had been hired by the defense team for the trial, would later say that Pamela was never able to live on her own or to care for her children without a lot of help and support. And Damien's grandmother, Nanny, she was also not biologically related to him because remember, Pamela, Damien's mother, had been the product of an affair that her father, Slim, had had with Nanny, who was a Native American woman. So when Nanny found out that she couldn't have children of her own, she basically took Pamela in and raised her as her own child. And uh, her husband, Slim, and Pamela's father had died the year before, so Nanny took in Damien, who, like I said, his name is Michael Wayne Hutchison at this point. We're going to keep calling him Damien so it doesn't get confusing. She took in Damien and, you know, she was working at a, a truck stop as a cashier. And it was just a lot for her, too, at her age. But she wanted to help. And Damien has both good and bad memories from his time in Mississippi with his grandmother. He said they lived in a white and purple trailer on a hill surrounded with trees, and they had two dogs, Smokey and Bear, who they'd raised from puppies. But from a very early age, Damien found a strange fascination and sometimes a fear of certain things in life, and he would fixate on some of these things. He remembers being dropped off at daycare when he was little, and his grandmother went into work so early that when he got dropped off there, it was still dark, and the people would try to like put him down in like a cot and make him go to sleep. But he was so lonely and scared that he would just cry the whole time. Now, this obviously causes trauma in a young kid. And he said when his grandmother would tuck him into bed at night, she would tell him, you know, like well, many of us have done, sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. And he said that when the lights went off and his grandmother left, all he could think about were these like bed bugs with their big, sharp teeth crawling towards him, their mouths watering, just like trying to get a taste of his flesh. So He's got a big imagination, but in a child, this also signals something of like anxiety, you know, like, yes, you have an imagination, but right off the bat, things make you very anxious. Things stress you out. You know, you you uh, fantasize about things that aren't real and you think they are and they become this very real looming thing in your life that you're constantly scared of. And he seemed to do this a lot with things. We are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Over the past few years, the job market has drastically changed, and we at Crime Weekly truly think that one of the biggest hiring challenges of 2023 is standing out to top talent. Job seekers want more, as they should, from remote working conditions to easier application processes to a better snapshot of what your company offers and what your company culture is like. The question is, how can you break through the clutter and attract the most qualified candidates for your business? And as we have found, the answer is ZipRecruiter. So about six months ago, Derek and I were actually looking for a new editor for the podcast, and it was just a really... Um, tedious process. It was like about months of, you know, a lot of legwork on Derek's part, especially interviewing people, going through resumes, finding out that a lot of people didn't stack up to what they put in their resumes. And thankfully, we did find somebody. But if we'd known about ZipRecruiter, I feel like it would have been so much easier and so much quicker. ZipRecruiter's technology sends you great candidates for your job, and you can send a personal invite to your top choices to really make an impact. ZipRecruiter also makes it very easy for candidates to apply to your job instead of having to 
fill out, you know, a long and tedious application, they can apply with just one click. And I think that this is amazing because I've been on these job sites before years ago and I remember how annoying it was. And it felt like I had to jump through so many hoops to just even get my name on a list of applicants. And ZipRecruiter also offers attention grabbing labels like urgent, training provided, remote, and more. And this will help your job catch the eye of great candidates and also make sure everyone's on the same page and not wasting their time. If you're hiring or if you're looking for a job, we believe that ZipRecruiter is the best place to achieve both goals. And Derek's going to tell you how you can check it out for yourself. Get your job noticed by the best and brightest candidates with ZipRecruiter. Four to five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See it for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Crime Weekly. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Crime Weekly. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So we're back and we're continuing on with Damien Eccles' childhood. And honestly, life never got more consistent or less chaotic for Damien. It kind of got worse. He would eventually rejoin his family, but within just a few years, they would live in six different states because his father, Joe, seemed to also suffer from some emotional instability. Joe Hutchison was described as being immature, self-absorbed, and sometimes cruel to his wife and children. He would call them names. He would threaten to physically harm them. He would destroy things that he knew they liked or cared about. And Joe Hutchinson could not keep a job, which meant he was unable to provide for his family, and this sent him into even lower depths. Damien said that the best memories he has of his father included horror movies. Horror movies were a big tradition for his family. He remembered staying up late, snuggling on the couch with his dad, watching scary movies. And sometimes his father would put on Halloween masks and stand outside Damien's window to scare him. So once again, he he literally says like horror in general as a genre gives him warm feelings of nostalgia and things like that. But like it is traumatic to scare the shit out of your kid with a Halloween mask outside of his bedroom at night. That's traumatic for a kid. Although it's hilarious, I will say, as somebody who (laughs) probably shouldn't be scaring my kids as much as I do, but I get such a kick out of it. (laughs) But like if I stood outside my kid's window with a Halloween mask on, they would die. Like I I can't even imagine. They would never want to sleep in their rooms again. So This does kind of like cause a feeling of I'm not safe here. I'm not secure here because there could be something outside the window waiting to get me or some bed bugs crawling towards me. In 1979, when Damien was in kindergarten, he and his family moved into the Mayfair apartment complex in West Memphis. Now, remember, this is the same complex that borders the woods at Robin Hood Hill. Damien said that at this age, he was very quiet and withdrawn. He didn't want to bring attention to himself. And when Damien was eight years old, they had moved to a rented house in Memphis and he saw a man shot in the head, which was something that stayed with him. Over the years, because Damien and his family were incredibly poor, they had to live in very bad conditions. Sometimes they could only afford a shack in someone's backyard with no electricity and no heat. And one time they had to rush his little sister Michelle to the emergency room because she had accidentally backed into one of the space heaters that they'd been using and she badly burned her legs and her back. And Damien remembers having to constantly rely on charity and the kindness of others, whether it was food stamps, the Salvation Army, or the Shriners bringing food for Christmas. Damien said that his father, Joe, was extremely ashamed of having to accept handouts. And Damien believes this deeply wounded Joe Hutchinson in a way that pushed him towards an emotional cliff. In his book, Damien writes, quote, I wasn't old enough to really understand it. I just knew that he was chewing his nails so viciously that sometimes it looked like he was going to put his whole hand in his mouth. Now I know it's because a man who accepted a handout wasn't really seen as being much of a man. As I grew older, I learned to be ashamed of being poor, too. It became humiliating, something I'd do everything I could to hide from the rest of the world. I developed an overwhelming sense of being excluded from everything. Everywhere you look, you see people with things that you do not have, and it has a profound mental effect, end quote. At one point, Damien and his family had to move in with Nanny and her new husband because they just didn't have any money and they didn't have any place to live. And Joe Hutchinson was out there you know, trying to find somewhere for them to live. But it was during this time that Joe and Pam, or Damien's parents, they began to fight a lot until Joe moved out and into a motel. And then eventually, after a couple of months, he and Pam split for good. 
and they would get a divorce. Now, after this, Pam married a man 20 years her senior named Jack Eccles. He was a roofer. They had met at church, and it was during this time that Jack legally adopted Damien and Michelle. And that's when Damien changed his name from Michael Hutchison to Damien Eccles. And Damien heavily disliked his new stepfather. He described him as a hateful bastard who only got worse with age, a man who made them attend services at the Church of God at least three times a week. And apparently this was like one of those churches where, you know, you lay hands on each other and like, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed, you know, like kind of one of those. What are they, Baptists? Are they Baptist churches? I can't even... I think they are, but I could be wrong. Oh like, God, I mean, I'm not even gonna go down that road. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's definitely it might be Baptist. I want to if you made me say Southern that's, Baptist or something, you know, someone will someone in the comments will know because I'm sure it's prevalent in their community or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not as prevalent up here in the Northeast at all. It's more of a Southern thing, right? Is that fair to say? I mean, I think I think so. I, yeah. At least around where I live, I don't have a lot of those type. Churches mm-hmm. is a thing up here. It's prevalent. I, we, a lot of Catholic people. Yeah, but in we're the in area. the we're East like, Coast, so we're yeah. like Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the churches are very traditional, I guess, I, in the sense of what you would think of a church, where down there it's a little bit more, it's different. We'll just say it's different. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> so Damien does this a lot. So he talks a lot of shit about Jack Ackles. Um, Jack was kind of seemed like not the greatest guy. He had six children from his previous marriage, and the oldest child was only a couple years younger than Pam, his new wife. And so, you know, Damien wasn't a big fan, but he does this with Jack. He does this with his mom. He does this with everybody that he kind of talks badly about in his book. He'll be like, oh, he was kind of a dick. He did this. He did that. Like there was a couple of times where Jack did get physical with him only twice. Damien is very um, quick to point that out. It was only twice that Jack kind of put his hands on him. But he also says, listen, like he wasn't all bad. And Damien does this with a lot of people that he talks about in his book. He said, quote, he wasn't an absolute monster any more than anyone else. He was just a man, both good and bad. I believe he did care about both my sister and me in his own way. He could be generous. He would stop to help every single person whose car was broken down on the side of the road, and he always gave hitchhikers a ride. He was also more tolerant of any form of self-expression I chose than any other parent would have been. I was free to dress however I pleased and listen to whatever music I liked. He had no problem with things like me wearing earrings, and I heard him tell my mother more than once, he's just trying to find himself, end quote. So Jack, Pamela, Damien, and Michelle moved to a place, I don't even know what to call it, a place outside of Marion, Arkansas, and reportedly this was just like a rundown shack in the middle of a field with no running water and only a wood stove for warmth. Damien said that rent was only $35 a month, but they were constantly spraying the field with pesticides and other chemicals, which not only ended up in the air, but also in their well water. And so Damien always had a constant headache and he struggled with allergies and he just like wasn't sleeping. He wasn't eating. He was miserable there. Damien said it was without a doubt the worst place he had ever lived and he'd lived some pretty bad places. And he said, quote, the entire house consisted of one room covered with an aluminum roof. There was no running water or electricity to speak of, no heat or air conditioning, and half of the front porch had caved in on itself. Looking at it, you would believe that such structures were inhabited only in third world countries, end quote. For example, Damien said during the summer it was so hot inside because of the metal roof, you felt like you were cooking and there was no escape from it. And then during the winter, it wasn't much better. The only source of heat was from a wood-burning stove, which filled the tiny shack with more smoke than heat. So your eyes would always be burning and your clothes would always be covered in soot. There were rats everywhere and because their only source of water was from the well, often the whole family had to bathe in the same water, which he was very disgusted by. He hated that. From later mental health evaluations, we can see that Damien's stepfather, Jack, also felt that there was something wrong going on with his stepson at this point because he said, quote, Damien went through these spells where he could not sleep no matter how hard he tried to. He stayed up for three or four nights in a row without sleeping at all. These periods were very hard for him, and by the end of the second day of no sleep, he was exhausted, fussy, and miserable. He cried a lot during these times. We can never figure out why he was so upset. Damien never was a really happy boy. He got really sad sometimes, and no one, including Damien, had any idea what was wrong. 
He cried really hard, and I asked him what was making him so sad, and he told me that he did not know. Damien used to spend a few days in a row where he cried really hard. During these periods, Damien sometimes started laughing uncontrollably. There were other times when Damien had so much energy, he did not know what to do. He got really excited and kind of hyper, and he always walked at these times. Damien walked to some of the parks in the area and to some of his friends' houses and across town. Damien did not decide where he was supposed to walk to, but got a feeling about where he should be. But when he got where he was going, his feeling changed and he had to go somewhere else. Sometimes Damien did not have any appetite and he did not eat for several days, end quote. And people who are um, anti Damien Eccles, they'll use these things to sort of illustrate like he was trouble, like he was disturbed. He had all of this stuff going on. And like, I get it. But at the same time, like, I think that they're forgetting this was a teenager, like a young kid. He's 13, 14 years old. There's a lot of changes happening. It does sound like he had some mental health issues. I mean, if you also look at it, both his mother and father suffered from some emotional and mental instability. So we do know that it can be genetic sometimes and you got a double dose there. Maybe some depression, maybe some bipolar. Do we not call it bipolar anymore? I don't want to be offensive. (laughs) I don't, I don't, I think bipolar is still a, a, a recognized term, right? I mean, is to it? be bipolar disorder, that's a, that's a thing. Okay. Right? Sounds so. like a little bipolar, right? Staying up for nights, you're in your manic phase, you're not eating, you, you got to walk, you know, and then kind of like you're, you're crying for days on end and you're miserable. That's, you know, that sound. that's what it sounds like to me. And I mean, maybe I am biased <laughs> because I went through a lot of these things when I was his age, like at that time, like a young teenager and and kind of growing up, I went through a lot of these things. I felt this way. There'd be times where I was sad and I didn't know why. And I would cry and I wouldn't know why. And I didn't want to sleep and I didn't want to eat. And I was just unhappy. And I think that sometimes people go through that and and it it does mean maybe you're a little disturbed and you got stuff to work through, but it does not mean that you're going to go on and kill three eight-year-old boys and then like torture them. You know what I mean? Because I really want us to keep in mind as we're going through this, Not just that Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore were murdered. They were tortured. Okay, so you can look at Damien and say he was disturbed. You know, he had some stuff going on. But would he would he be capable of torturing three eight year old boys and then murdering them? That's really something we have to keep in mind here. It does. And I think what you said as far as genetically, they could, he could be predisposed to these types of feelings because obviously it can come from their, your parents. I also think environmentally, whether you're genetically predisposed to it or just the conditions you're in, like you're talking mm-hmm. about here where it was not the best conditions, but you're mm-hmm. right. Not everybody, a lot of people have had struggles as a childhood based on their home life and have gone on to be very uh, successful members of society and contributing members in all different ways. That, and they actually use these things to motivate them and to help others. What I'm interested in, and we're not going to get it from Damien's book, and I don't, I'm not knocking him for this. You wouldn't expect it, but to find out if there's any evidence in his childhood of him doing things, maybe to other kids or animals, things that you would expect to see with someone who would be capable of doing what they did to these three little boys, right? Like you have to assume that this wasn't the first time the offender or offenders uh, had carried out something like this. It might have been an escalation where this was the first time with human beings, but I would expect to see something in our, if we knew who the offender was right now and we had a biography on them uh, and it was not, you know, it was not being written, it was not an autobiography, but something where we had evidence, whether it was through law enforcement or social services that suggested this individual had carried out or conducted things in a similar manner like this, where they had caused harm to like I said, smaller, you know, other kids, siblings, or even small animals. This is something you would expect to see during that phase where as they got older, um, the urges elevated and they ended up going on to hurt actual people. Yeah. So there are reports of Damien, like I said, disemboweling animals, dogs, really? things like that. But it, there's no evidence of it. It's just okay. people came forward Hearsight. and said, oh, I heard that Damien does this. OK. Yeah. That, you know? that means that means absolutely nothing to me. Then. It means absolutely nothing. Yeah. And Damien will admit like, yeah, you know, 
I did this. Like he would get into fights in school, you know, kids his own age, things like that. He's angry. He's got, you know, his different reasons for that. And but but everything that is said where he's like involved with some sort of harm to a younger child or an animal is all hearsay. There no is proof. no proof or evidence of it. Correct. And that is very important, <laughs> you know, obviously, because anybody can say anything about you. It's what, what do you what do you have to back it up? And and I also say this and I'm not not something that I'm doing, but I will also say not to defend this type of practice, but devil worshipers or people who are into that sort of thing. I think it's also important to note that not all people in that realm that practice that are people who automatically want to hurt other human beings. There's, I'm not, I'm not an astute enough to talk about it, but you're not but, a cult specialist. Are you kidding me? You're not a cult specialist, but even just someone who pract who studies the devil and that side of it, doesn't necessarily mean that they're out there to kill people or hurt people. It may not be something that you or I agree with or or practice ourselves, but there's a it's not it's important not to lump everyone like okay, if we were able to prove definitively that Damien Eccles and his crew were devil worshipers. Let's say we had photos and video of them sitting there with a pentagram, candles, doing a dance, whatever you want. We have proof of it. Yeah. Still, still mean doesn't mean they killed yeah. those kids yeah. because the two don't automatically go together where, okay, you're a devil worshiper, therefore you're a murderer. So I think it's important to differ to separate those two as well. Yeah, you're right. It really felt like these these people in this town were like, as soon as we find the devil worshipers, then we we'll have them. the murderers. And that's not true. And that's not true. Those two right. things are not mutually exclusive, no matter what you believe. And if you you can be morally against somebody worshiping the devil, which I mean, I think is like, OK, you can feel morally against that. I don't yeah. blame you. I'm not on team devil. <laughs> that's just me personally. We're, we're not team devil here. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always been of the mindset is like, do what you want. If you're not hurting anybody. Yeah, who cares? Then I do not care if it makes you happy and it gives you joy <laughs> to worship the devil go for it. Are there some people who not even necessarily worship the devil, but I know that there's other cultures um, like South Africa, they they do something called muti and they basically kill children and, you know, young people to take their body parts to to get, I guess, good, good luck and stuff, get good luck and basically make wishes. And it's, it's like voodoo kind of thing. So there are cultures out there who do these things. But even then, you could say like, oh, you're a South African who practices muti, but unless I have evidence that that is what you did in this case, it's just, you That's know, right. a hint. It's just circumstantial at that point. And right. it they're not mutually exclusive. It, it doesn't mean you did this just because you happen to believe something or or follow a religion that does this. Right. And, and what you said there, too, because I don't want to skate over it with this religion that you were just talking about where they've killed other children or sacrificed children. Again, talking about this specific case, even if I could prove that Damon Eccles had hurt someone or or killed someone else in the city or in the town, it doesn't mean that they did that carried out this evidence. It may be more suggestive, but you still have to have evidence to link them to the specific crime that you're investigating. You can't just make the leap. So I, I'm not trying to give him an out here. I'm not a defense attorney by any means, but you have to have something in this specific case that tangibly links him to the crime. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm waiting to hear or see. Haven't seen it yet. Haven't heard it yet. Still very early. We still got half the episode to go here. We got other parts to go, but it's important to note that there there is a difference. As we just said, you can't just link one part of it and automatically make the leap that it would lead him to commit, you know, three murders. Absolutely. And I will say if there's anybody listening or watching and you are very much anti uh, Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin and Jesse Miss Kelly, and you believe a million percent that they're responsible for this, I respect you. And I'm so totally open to hearing that. Send me an email, Stephanie Harlow at stephanieharlow.com and give me a list of all the reasons you think that. And then give me a list of all the physical evidence or even circumstantial evidence that you have to support that list of beliefs. And I will look at it and I will include it in this. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Like you, there are people like Derek was saying who know these cases inside and out far better than I ever could because I have to move on to another case. And there's some people who spend years just looking at one case. Well, you and said there's that, a book, right? There's a book about how they who uh, based on them being guilty, right? Is not one there of your is, reference yes, sources. the case so, against I mean, the West Month, the case against the West Memphis. So threes. there's literally a, a published book out there that of, of, of an author who believes mm -hmm. they're guilty. 
And you're, yeah. you use that as a reference material. So we're going to have did. some of that in here. Yeah. But I mean, I really want people to feel heard. And I don't want you to think that I'm writing off your beliefs. And if you're passionate about this, like if somebody looked at me and said, I think Casey Anthony is innocent, prove me wrong, send me an email, I'd be on that shit quick. You know, I'd be I'd send you a 10 page email because I'm that passionately in belief of Casey Anthony's guilt. And I am that passionately like, uh, you know, I believe that she did this. So and it would bother me to hear somebody say that she didn't, and I'd have to have a conversation with them. So I completely get it. Send me an email, Stephanie Harlow at stephanieharlow.com. Let me know all the reasons you think that these three teenagers were guilty and, you know, any evidence you have to back it up. And I'm not even being sarcastic. I know it's hard to tell with me sometimes. You just opened that Pandora's box, but okay. <laughs> That's all right. I, cool. I'll, I'll just dive in that freaking box. I'm ready for it because the people who follow us are logical human beings with brains and nobody's going to come at me sideways. And we're going to have some really good, productive conversations from these emails. So I truly believe that. And I hope that everyone proves me right. But let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. I know we like to say that size doesn't matter. And in some situations, I guess that's true, but not when you're traveling, not when you're trying to make sure that you don't forget anything important that you might need for your next adventure. For instance, my base weekender bag has room for everything. And with hyper-functional and fashionable designs, you've got all the nooks and crannies and even some surprise space to effortlessly fit it all in. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell, and she wanted to create sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories that are designed to help you travel effortlessly but still look fashionable while doing it. And Base has thought of everything you could want in a piece of luggage, from 360-degree gliding wheels to a cushioned handle for comfortability to a built-in weight indicator to save you time at check-in to washable bags for dirty clothes and all the interior pockets you could ask for to keep you organized and in control of your travel experience. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors, so there's truly something for everyone. And for shorter trips or for a carry on, the Weekender bag cannot be beat. It's one of my favorite and most used base pieces. I love how easy it is to pack and I love that there's a separate compartment at the bottom for shoes. Every piece is made to look better with miles, so don't be afraid of what's happening to your luggage in the overhead bin or in cargo storage. Just relax and plan more vacations, more trips, and more adventures because base has you covered. And if you don't believe us, check out their over 30,000 five-star reviews. We highly encourage you to check out base, their bags, their luggage. They they have a great travel makeup bag that's super easy to clean out. It's so it's actually hard to believe how easy it is to clean out and how great it is. I love it. Base is great. And Derek is going to tell you how you can take advantage of a great deal we have for you right now. That's right. Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash crime weekly. That's basetravel.com slash crime weekly for 15% off your first purchase. If you're looking how to spell that, that's B-E-I-S travel.com slash crime weekly. We are back and we're continuing on. So Damien's obviously having a hard time. Life sucks. And he said during this time and basically for the rest of his life, the only thing that brought him any comfort was music and books. He liked to walk a lot. And the only places that were close enough to walk were the courthouse and the library. So he would spend hours in the library reading Stephen King and Dean Koontz over and over again. But Damien also stumbled on other material, too. He said, quote, later I discovered the ultimate horror, the Inquisition. The first time I stumbled across this atrocity was in a book by some demented adult that was titled something like The Children's Book of Devils and Fiends. It was filled with tales of witches having orgies, standing in line to kiss the devil devil's ass, eating children and cursing people so that they went into convulsions. It is not possible to overstate the impact all of this had on my young mind. I would lie in bed at night scared to move while my imagination conjured up horrific images, end quote. Damien said that this, along with his stepfather's religious zealousness, convinced him that he was going to burn in hell for all of eternity because of the things that he thought about, you know, the things that any normal young person boy thinks about. He said at this time his sexual appetite was insatiable, you know. He thought he was smarter than everyone else, and although he wanted badly to be good, he said he didn't seem to be able to manage it. And once again, I think we've all struggled with these thoughts. They will use him saying something like this, I wanted to be good, but I couldn't seem to manage it, and use it against him like, oh, he was evil. That's not what that means. That means you're a kid 
who's growing up in a very like conservative, traditional, you know, suffocating sort of environment. And so natural urges like sexual urges and things like that are really viewed as being bad. And so you feel bad as a result. You feel guilty and you feel like a sinner because you're told you are. So that's what he's saying. He's not saying like, oh, I was a bad person. Like I'm evil and no matter what, I just couldn't be good. Like we have to remember we're talking about a teenage boy here. It was in that book that Damien also got his introduction to Aleister Crowley. So Aleister Crowley was a British occultist and author who was a practitioner of magic with a K. And Aleister Crowley called himself the Beast 666. And after his death, he would become a pop culture figure. His picture was on the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album cover. That's a Beatles album. And Jimmy Page, the guitarist for Led Zeppelin, would buy a house near Loch Ness in Scotland that had once been owned by Crowley. So, yeah, Aleister Crowley, Anton LaVey, they all kind of became synonymous for a time with like musicians and, you know, how they kind of like branched out and they were like looking into darker things and stuff like that. Completely normal. I mean, whether you agree with it or not, completely normal. There there was nothing that like, you know, the lead, the, the guitarist Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin wasn't out there murdering kids because he read Aleister Crowley. So going forward, in 1986, Damien began junior high and this is where he would get his first taste of beer He would also be introduced to pornography and meet his good friend, Jason Baldwin. Damien ended up having to repeat his first year of junior high because he had turned in zero assignments and gotten Fs in every class. But that summer, he started skateboarding. He got really good. He liked it. And Damien became that guy that was different from everyone else. His hair was different. One side of his scalp was shaved, but he kept the other side long. He wore combat boots while everyone else was rocking Nikes, and he had both his ears and both his nipples pierced. And he was so disruptive in class, screaming out nonsense randomly, mocking teachers, so he was thrown out at least once a week. When Damien met Jason Baldwin, he said it was a case of opposites attracting, quote, I don't recall hearing him ever speak during his first year of junior high. I was the immature pervert who liked to amuse himself by looking up vulgar words in the dictionary during study hall. One day after exhausting my sexual vocabulary for the millionth time, I slammed my dictionary shut and looked up with the intention of finding someone to bother. Looking back at me was a skinny kid with a black eye and a long blonde mullet. He was wearing a Motley Crue t-shirt, and judging by the paper on his desk, he'd been drawing and doodling to kill time. There was a backpack propped up next to his feet that turned out to not contain a single book. Instead, it had a large collection of cassette tapes, Metallica, Anthrax, Iron Maiden, Slayer, and every other hair band a young hoodlum could desire. He often brought a small Walkman with him, and he would pass me one of his earpieces during study hall or months later on the bus so we could both listen, end quote. Now, at this time when he met Jason Baldwin, Damien was still living in the shack in the middle of the field, but then his grandmother, Nanny, had a heart attack, and this was her second heart attack, and she he also called her an amputee, so I'm not sure exactly what she had amputated, but basically she's older, she's an amputee, she's had two heart attacks, she needed someone to take care of her. So Damien and his family moved into Nanny's trailer in Lakeshore. And this was when he and Jason began interacting outside of school because they were on the same bus. They lived in the same trailer park. Jason would come over to Damien's and they would listen to music after school. And every weekend, they either stayed together at Damien's or at Jason's. Damien said, quote, over the years, Jason and I became as close as brothers because we knew there was no one else to look out for us. We shared everything we had, food, clothes, money, whatever. If one of us had it, both of us had it. It was known without having to be said. End quote. Now, the way that Damien met Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. was, according to him, completely by accident. One day he had knocked on Jason's door, but Jason's mother, Gail, told Damien that Jason was at Jesse Miss Kelly's. And Damien said, quote, I'd heard the name before, and from the sounds of it, he was supposed to be one of the Lakeshore badasses. About halfway down the street, I heard Jason yell and looked to my left to see him standing in the open doorway of a trailer. It turned out that Jesse Miss Kelly lived only about four or five trailers down from Jason, end quote. Before we move on in the timeline, let's talk about Jason Baldwin and Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. a little bit more in depth because we have more to talk about with Damien. But Jason Baldwin, who'd be 16 in May of 1993 when these three boys were killed, he was generally known around town as a good kid. He lived in a trailer with his mother who struggled with schizophrenia. 
She worked nights and she left Jason in charge of his younger brothers because their father had left years ago. The father left when Jason was four. Jason would get his brothers dinner, help them with their homework, and get them into bed each night. And Jason didn't mind this. He felt protective of his mother. He appreciated that even though she struggled very much with her mental illness and some days were better for her than others, she still worked so hard to support them and to make sure they had a roof over their head. In fact, once his mother had tried to take her own life and Jason had been the one to find her and call 911, and later in a school essay, he referred to this experience as pretty devastating. His neighbors referred to Jason as a sweet and gentle boy, that they often left their own children with, or, you know, they felt safe with Jason keeping an eye on their children. He was a good student. You know, he wasn't like an excellent student, but he was good. He got good grades. He was a talented artist. He wore concert tees. He liked heavy metal music. And he was best friends with Damien Eccles, which I really believe would be his downfall. And the only run-in with law enforcement that Jason had ever had was in 1990 when he was 12, and he would be charged with breaking and entering in criminal mischief. So apparently... Near the trailer park, there was a rusted building with some old cars inside. And one day, Jason, his younger brother, Matt, who was 10 at the time, and two other boys went in there. And I guess they were, like, throwing some rocks at the cars. And I guess Jason and and his friends and his brother thought it was just, like, a, a broken down, kind of abandoned place. But according to the police report, the cars inside were vintage. The report said the boys had broken the glass on a front-end loader, a 1969 Cadillac, and a 1959 Ford. And this is ultimately what put Jason on probation, where he met Jerry Driver and Steve Jones, who he believes hated him from the start, and accused him and Damien of getting a cult started far before these three eight-year-old boys were murdered. Jason claims that other kids would approach him and they'd say, hey, we hear you and Damien have a cult. And when Jason asked where they'd heard this, they told him that they had heard it from the police. Yeah, that's not good when even the kids are hearing it because where are they usually hearing it from? Their parents. There you go. Yeah. That's dinner, dinner talk. You know, not good. Yeah, and I mean, keep in mind, too, like, these are the very religious people. They're all going to church every Sunday, and you know that they were talking to their kids, and, like, you stay away from those kids because, from what we hear, they're into some, like, dark nonsense, and they're into something bad. And so, obviously, the kids are like, what? Like, they're enchanted by this. They they need to know more. And so, they're approaching Jason and, and Damien, and they're like, oh, we heard you guys have a call. And, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's ludicrous. One other thing about Steve Jones, you know, I... I, I I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing as a probationary officer or a juvenile officer if you're, I mean, your number one job is to help rehabilitate these kids, right? Like there's still a course correction for most of them where they're making the wrong choices. They get a slap on the wrist. They get reprimanded for what they're doing and you can help them get back on the right track so that they end up in the right place down the road. Mm -hmm. That's your goal. That's your job. You can still note these children that are having issues because sometimes- Regardless of how much effort is put into trying to straighten these kids out, sometimes they still they still go down a life of crime. It's just the way it goes. So it is okay to note this and be aware of it because there may be something down the road that because of past behavior, because of past criminal history, some kids you didn't get through to may be good for a bigger crime down the road. And having mm-hmm. this intelligence may help you solve it. I've definitely had cases where we've had juveniles who are in our system, who are They start off breaking car windows, then they have like an assault, then they're Mm -hmm. stealing stuff from the store, then they light something on fire. Um, I'm thinking of one kid in particular, dealt with him my whole patrol career. And sure enough, time went on, he started to hang around with the wrong people. He got into a local gang. Um, We tried to help this guy out a million times. And sure enough, he ended up committing a murder on a street over from the police station. And it was because of his past history and his affiliations that we were able to track it down and someone, long story short, we caught him. But it it was tough because even though we had developed a relationship with him through his juvenile past, it was, you kind of look at him and think, you know, see your failure for yourself professionally because you couldn't, as much as you tried, you couldn't deter him from that lifestyle. But if it wasn't for those past interactions and understanding the way he operated, we wouldn't have gotten him as an adult when he had just turned eight, he had literally just turned 18 when this happened. And so that was what allowed us to, to, to solve the case. But in this particular situation, yeah, it's okay to say, Oh, 
they, they, these guys didn't have the best childhood. They may have done some things, but to go from car vandalism to murder, that's a that's a big jump to make. Yeah, and sometimes something like what Jason did is, you know, a gateway to worse behavior. And sometimes it's just stupid kid shit. The bump right? in the road. Yeah, like, and this is like, I'm going to sound like such an old person, but this is where like parental guidance needs to come in because I know I, I sit before you today looking like a sweet, innocent girl, but man, I was not a good <laughs> Who kid. Said <laughs> who, who said that? Who said that? Everyone just gave you like the stink eye as soon as you said that. All of you our don't viewers. think I look sweet and innocent? You may look sweet and innocent until you open your mouth. Yeah, what are you talking about? I don't think anybody looks at Stephanie Harlow and says you're sweet and innocent. They may think you're empathetic and you're and you're someone who cares about the people she talks about and all these things. But I don't think I'm going to go, Stephanie Harlow, she's so sweet and innocent. You don't give that impression at all. I think they say that, Derek. Okay. (laughs) Way way down in the comments below on that one. (laughs) Sweet and innocent. (laughs) So anyways, I may sit before you today looking like the sweet, innocent little girl that I have become. However, I was a bad kid and my mom brought me and my friend, like I always tell this story, (laughs) my mom brought me and my friend to like one of her appointments and we were hanging out in the parking garage and we were bored, man, idle hands, okay? We were bored and so for some reason we just picked up rocks and started throwing them from the top level of the parking garage to the bottom level where there's there's cars there, you know, and we broke some windshields. Were we trying to break some windshields? No. Were we mad that we'd broken the windshields? Not really. I was 12 and I was like, this is kind of sweet. Like, ha ha ha. I felt like really. And yo, my mom, I don't want to tell you what she did, but in the end, I had to pay for that shit. I had to pay for those windshields. I didn't need any jury drivers or Steve Jones or probation officers. My mother was like, that's not how I raised you. And you're going to feel this. You're going to hurt and you're going to sacrifice and you're going to suffer until these windshields are paid off and you'll never break another one. I promise you you'll never throw another rock at a car. And I have not. In fact, every time I have a rock in my hand, I just drop it because I have PTSD now. I'm like, no rocks. Okay. So this is where parental guidance comes in, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to go on to be a juvenile delinquent just because they were bored and with their friend and they did something stupid. So, and, and this is once he's never been in trouble with the law before after that you know, or before that. So I think that also says something, especially when you're in West Memphis and it feels like these police officers ain't got nothing better to do than just like troll around and catch kids doing things they shouldn't. I mean, even remember the night that the three boys were missing, Regina Meeks had to go and like answer a call about eggs being thrown at a house. You know, it's not like this is New York City. You know, it's not like Brooklyn and there's like all the cops are just like running around trying to to take care of violent crime and stuff. This is like West Memphis and the cops were pretty bored and it seems like if he was getting into trouble, he would have been caught. So I don't think he was doing anything after that incident with the cars. Exactly. He's on the radar at that point. So yeah, where's the where's the things in between that led to this escalation that got you to a triple homicide? Nothing. You don't always need that. I'm not sitting here saying, oh, you don't have that, so you can't have this. But you would expect to see some type of escalation, something else between you know, the car vandalism to that. So let's talk about Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. He was 17 in May of 1993 when the three boys were murdered. Damien was the oldest. Damien was 18, Jesse was 17, and Jason was 16. And Jesse Miss Kelly lived with his father and his younger brother. His mother had left the family when he was just four. And Jesse's often described as being simple-minded or simple. And it's a known fact that his IQ was very low. During the trial, Dr. William Wilkins testified that Jesse's IQ was 72 and his reasoning levels were that of a 6 to 8-year-old. Dr. Wilkins also said that Jesse came from a family with a history of substance abuse and child abuse and Jesse had admitted to huffing gasoline for two years when he was about 13 or 14 and he regularly used both marijuana and alcohol. And the defense would have liked you to believe that Jesse was very childlike and susceptible, while the prosecution wanted you to believe that he functioned completely normally for a 17-year-old. And I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. I don't think that Jesse was as simple-minded as the defense team wanted him to appear, but I definitely don't think he was as like calculating and intelligent as the prosecution wanted him to appear. So I do think he was someplace in the middle. He definitely wasn't like – and you will know this because – he his some of his interview with police is tape recorded and so you can hear him and then also there's you know transcripts of his interviews so you can clearly see 
he's not, you know, processing things like a 17 or a typical 17 year old would. He's not using logic and reasoning that a typical 17 year old would. So whether it's just because he had a low IQ or whether it's because he was huffing gasoline, killing all his brain cells when he was like 12, 13 years old, I don't know. But he definitely wasn't like fair to say it's a combination of the two, probably right? could could be <laughs> might be a recipe for making stupid decisions. I've never huffed gasoline before. I didn't know it that it was a thing. Um, so I couldn't tell you. Have you did you know that was a thing? I've never heard of that in my life. Gasoline. Gasoline. I do love the smell of gasoline. I will tell you. A lot of people do spray cans, things like that, like uh, paint. You can flip them upside down. The cool whip cans, you know, like the uh, whipped cream cans. Yeah, the whippets. Yeah, Yeah. there's a lot of stuff you can inhale. Yeah, we did that, man. But huffing gasoline, I always love the smell. Like my mom was pumping gas. I would roll down the window and like it smells so good, you know, explains a lot. (laughs) <laughs> That's where my brain cells went. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, so Jesse was known to have a hot temper. He got into some fights in school, including with Jason Baldwin, apparently. Like, the, he and Jason Baldwin met when Jesse, like, punched him in the face. And Jesse ended up dropping out of school after being held back two grades, and then he started working with his father, who was a mechanic. Now, Jesse was only just over five feet tall, but he had dreams of being a professional wrestler. And besides some, like I said, fighting at school and some fights, he'd only gotten in trouble with the law once when he'd stolen some flags from the high school band um, to use on his homemade racetrack. So basically, Jesse was driving by the school and he saw these flags, the band flags, and he was like, let me take these for my track and then display them on my track, which is in public. So to me, that is a sign that Jesse's not like using logic and reasoning because it's like a small town. If you steal the flags and like I said, the West Memphis Police Department ain't got nothing better to do than be like, where'd these band flags go? We need to track it down. And they find them at his house. It's not like he tried to hide it. He didn't even think like, oh, they're going to put two and two together. He just was like, I want these flags for my homemade racetrack. And he took them. But that's the only trouble that I could find where he's been in with the law. Let's take our last break and we'll be right back. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I personally do a lot of online shopping, not just for me, but for the entire family. And I like online shopping because it allows you to check different places for the best deal. And I'm a human, so I do love a good deal. I'm the one that's always trying to stack coupons and use multiple discount codes all at once to see what I can get away with. It's like an exciting competition. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past because Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. It works really easily. Uh, It's very simple. It's almost too easy, actually. Uh, Imagine you're shopping at one of your favorite stores or websites. When you check out, the Honey button will appear and all you have to do is hit apply coupon. Then you just wait a few seconds while Honey searches for coupons it can find for that website or that store. And if they find a working coupon, you can actually see your total just drop right in front of your eyes. You really have to do nothing else besides that. I use Honey all the time specifically at craft stores because there's always coupons out there that I don't have the time um, or the tenacity to search for myself, candle stores, things like that. But I love it. Honey does really work and it works for me. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop computers. It works on your iPhone as well. All you have to do is activate it on Safari on your phone and then save on the go. So please check Honey out. You'll be so glad you did. Derek's going to tell you how you can get started. That's right. If you don't already have Honey, you could straight up be missing out. And by getting it, you'll not only be doing yourself a solid, but you'll be supporting the show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash crime weekly. That's joinhoney.com slash crime weekly. Everything's getting more expensive, and if you're already saddled with debt, it can feel like you're falling even further behind every single day. Don't you ever wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? PDS Debt has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt saving options from PDS Debt. Right now, PDS PDS Debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing a simple 30-second online debt assessment 
at pdsdebt.com slash crime. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and there's no minimum credit score required. Both bad and fair credit are accepted. You can save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. And if you like what you hear, stay tuned because Derek's going to tell you how you can get started paying off your debt right now. That's right. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash crime. That's pdsdebt.com slash crime. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash crime. Okay, we're back and we're talking about Damien again. And we're talking about how did Damien get on the radar of law enforcement and why did Jerry Driver become so fixated on him? Because Damien was older than his best friend, Jason. It was a really big shock for him when he went to high school and Jason had to stay in junior high. And Damien said that this things shifted for him at this point. He said the sense of security and stability he'd achieved through his friendship with Jason for the past three years, it was gone. And he felt he had to start from scratch. On top of that, Damien could not have felt more isolated from the kids in his new school. He said that Marion High School pulled its student body from mainly middle and upper class neighborhoods. And this was a place where, quote, kids drove brand new cars to school, wore Gucci clothing, and had enough jewelry to spark the envy of rap stars. This was a place where I definitely didn't fit in. In response to my new environment, my behavior grew even more outrageous and I was viewed as a freak, end quote. A 16-year-old Damien met 15-year-old Deanna Holcomb when she was passing out programs during one of his little sister's choir concerts. He um, basically fell in love with her on first sight. If you you know hear it from him, he says she grinned at him like she knew something amusing that he didn't, and Damien was immediately hooked. In his book, Life After Death, Damien said, quote, I never went in to see the choir that night. Instead, I stayed out in the lobby with this girl who reeked of sex. It emanated from her like static electricity and was present in every gesture. The way she stood too close and looked up at me, the way she hooked her arm through mine and cocked her hip to the side as she talked, she didn't seem to be able to control it like a cat in heat, end quote weird. But Damien and Deanna began to see each other. They fell in love. And, you know, she told him that she was a Wiccan. And this was a term he claimed he hadn't heard before. So he started to do his own research. And he also became friendly with a group of local teenagers who practiced Wicca. So Damien said that he found it to be a beautiful religion in theory, but he didn't really like the people who were involved in it. He found them to be immature and melodramatic. But he said it did act as a gateway to other areas of religion and spirituality. And so he would start kind of like investigating that and researching that. And he just couldn't get enough. He was really interested in all these different religions and different spiritual ideas and things like that. Now, Deanna's family, they were traditional and proper people. They didn't even let Deanna or her two sisters watch MTV. And at first, they welcomed Damien into their home and their lives. But when they found out that he and Deanna were having sex, that all changed. Deanna's parents told her she couldn't have anything to do with Damon anymore, and after a few months of trying to sneak around and still see each other, Deanna eventually said she could no longer do it, and she ended things. And Damien was, of course, heartbroken. And at this time, his mother and his stepfather were arguing a lot, making everyone around them miserable. And so Damien would just kind of like hide out in his room, reading Deanna's letters over and over again until eventually the pain became too much, and he burned them all in the sink. Now, to fill a little bit of the hole that Deanna had left in him, Damien began hanging out with another girl who lived in the trailer park, Domini Tier, a transfer student from Illinois. And Damien said, you know, maybe at that point, Domini saved his life. He had a lot of fun with her, but he doesn't know if he could say that he loved her, not like he had loved Deanna. He said Domini was a good person, honest, loyal. She didn't like to complicate things, and that is why they remained friends basically throughout, you know, his entire life, but he wasn't in love with her and he was still like hung up on Deanna. And during this time, Damien got into a fight in school when he found out through a mutual friend that his ex Deanna had been intimate with another person while she and Damien had been together. And so when Damien saw Deanna and this guy together at school, he lost it. 
and he went for him, scratching his face. And basically later he would say like, oh, he had tried to take out his eye and stuff like that. Like that's what he wanted to do. And once again, this will be used by people who are anti damien as you know showing he's capable of violence i think it's a stretch it is a big stretch for me like yeah you're jealous you're in love with this girl you're a teenage boy like yeah you want to kick the shit out of the guy that she slept with while she was dating you it's different than going after and murdering three eight-year-old boys that you don't know and torturing them it's things to note it's obviously things to note but this doesn't tie to this case in any way, shape, or form. There's no similarity to it. You could make an argument, maybe, maybe, if this was a woman that was killed, that had been his girlfriend at the time, and there was some signs of infidelity there, that maybe this would have been motive for him to carry out something like this, where he had shown signs of jealousy in the past, tendency to maybe become violent, and now you have a similar situation in the future where, okay, now you can see a pattern. But there's really no similarities here. So that's why... Yeah, we'll note it. I'm making, I'm writing it down right here on my notebook, but it's not something that I'm saying, ooh, here you go. He, now we're on to something. So yeah, noting it, but not really giving much weight to it. I agree. And uh, on May 7th, 1992, that's just about a year before the three eight-year-old boys in West Memphis were murdered, Damien uh, told a social worker who'd been sent to his home because of his behavior in school He told the social worker that he'd been suspended seven times just in the past semester for starting fights at school and also for starting fires. Now, after some tests, a report stated, quote, the behavior of this youngster is characterized by impulsive hostility. The desire to gain power and demean others springs from animosity and a wish to vindicate past grievances. This teenager believes that past degradations may be undone by provoking fear and intimidation in others. Cool and distant, this youth demonstrates little or no compassion for others, end quote. Once again, this is often used by the people who are against Damien, who are they're like, look, they, he said that he wants to gain power and demean others. And he's, uh, you know, has no compassion for others and, you know, things like this. Yes, once again, we will note it, but I could, you know, gather a group of 100 17 year old boys right now and i guarantee you half of them would exhibit these same sorts of feelings and emotions and you know they would all not all not all but some of them would be exhibiting these things because agreed teenage years are hard and they suck (laughs) agreed and i I know friends and relatives who've done similar things and they're not bad people and i'll I'll even say and I, i gave that example two minutes ago but just to refer back to Adnan Syed's case, that that whole situation where we're talking, we were talking about an ex girlfriend. So it's mm-hmm. more, it's more in line with what we're discussing, and therefore it becomes more valuable to look at it because it's it's in the same realm of the circumstances surrounding the actual case, the actual murder. We're mm-hmm. talking about three little boys who were mutilated and tortured. There's a big difference between that. And being jealous over a girlfriend and maybe wanting to get into a fist fight. Like, you know, there's a big difference there. And one of those two things is something that you may find with a lot of teen boys. The other is not. And that's why I was saying earlier, we're looking at not things like this, but more things where it shows signs of uh, an inability to process the harm to others, right? Not seeing the dangers of hurting an innocent animal or a small child and not being able to understand what you're doing and how it affects them. I'm not seeing that lack of connection here. The things that I'm seeing here is more in line with a a teenage boy who not only had a rough childhood, but even if they didn't, these are very, uh, I don't want to say normal things, but things you do say, see more often with kids around these ages. Yeah. And I will say, um, you know, could you, could you, like try to psychoanalyze Damien, you know, like people always get mad at me for doing and tell me I'm not like a mental health professional. Could you psychoanalyze Damien and say, well, he had such a shitty childhood. He felt resentful towards children who had good childhoods and or, you know, who who didn't have as bad childhoods as he did. And so he wanted to like make them pay for it or he wanted to take his like anger and aggression out on them. Like 
Yes, I guess you could say that, but you also couldn't say that Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, or Christopher Byers had any kind of good childhood. It's not like they were living it up and they had these wholesome families and like everybody was happy. You know, they kind of all share that in common. These six boys, Damien, Jason, Jesse, Stevie, Michael Moore, Christopher Byers, like they all kind of shared that in common is they came from very, you know, disruptive homes, like broken homes even. They had they had issues. They had step parents that they didn't always necessarily get along with and things like that. So you you could like try to psychoanalyze it and say his bad childhood make him, made him resent all their children, but there's no evidence of that. He's never said anything like that. He's nobody's even come forward and said that he's relayed feeling that way to them. So you know, anybody who's who's saying that, and there are people who do say that, like he hated children because he had a bad childhood. It's a stretch. It's a very big stretch. Yeah. I'm not so much as concerned with what we've heard so far. I definitely want to see how we get from here to the case itself, right? Like I'm assuming for the people who believe they're guilty, they're going to put something forward. We may not believe in it. We may, but there's going to be something where they they try to link the two crimes. And now maybe they're right, but that's a, that's what I'm interested in because nothing here tonight although very important to discuss because we people may feel differently than us. You're just giving them the facts. There may be people in the comments are saying, I don't agree with you. This is this is how it is relatable to this, and this is why it is important. So we'll hear what you guys have to say. You're hearing it the fir- for the first time like I am. I'm not seeing anything in here that if I, w- if I had this in a nice police report and I had all the juvenile reports from Damien's past or any of their pasts, I'm not looking at any of this and highlighting it as something that may be a sign of what was to come. Nothing yet, anyways. All right, well, let's continue on. So Damien was suspended after, like, going after this kid, but he and Deanna would later reunite. You know, she came to him. She was like, I miss you, blah, blah, blah. And so they planned to run away together. They figured this was the only way that they could be together away from her family. Now, the plan was to do it after the last day of school, and since neither of them had a driver's license or drove a vehicle, they set off on foot. And when it became too hot and they got tired of walking, Damien and Deanna decided to camp out in an abandoned trailer for the night. But Deanna's parents had called it in as soon as they realized she hadn't come home from school, and the two teenagers were soon discovered by the police. Damien was arrested and brought to the Crittenden County Jail, where he was introduced to a man who would become instrumental in his later arrest, Jerry Driver. This would also signal a point in time where things for Damien and his family went downhill very quickly. Because while Damien was in jail, he called his mother Pam and found out that his little sister Michelle had made sexual abuse accusations against their stepfather, Jack. Now, here's the thing. Why is Damien getting arrested? (laughs) For this, when he and his girlfriend ran away, like, what is the arrest? Ha- what is what is this happening? Like, I, I don't know. I thought you were going to tell us, like, what was the charge? There had to be something there. I don't. I mean, or at least something on paper. I don't know what it would be. She was of age, right? I mean, how old was she exactly? So he was. She was fifteen, and he was seventeen at that point. He had turned okay. seventeen. So that could be the issue. That could be something where it's like technically she. I mean, consent. She's under sixteen years old. So you could have a situation where it could be viewed uh, child endangerment, maybe. I don't know. It's all a stretch. I mean, if I'm doing that case, unless the parents are insistent on some type of charge, more than likely I'm bringing them both home to their respective parents and I'm letting them handle it amongst themselves. Now, there may have been something to just be to give the benefit of the doubt here, even though we're going over all this. Maybe it was something where the parents were adamant about it because mm-hmm. they were trying to separate I Damien think that you're from right. their daughter. The the parents did seem very adamant about bringing charges. So to be fair to law enforcement here, because I know we have a lot, we just got to call it, you know how we see it. There may have been something here where not only did they know who Damien Eccles wa- were, was and the, what they believed about him, now you have something where technically there is an offense here, an arrestable offense, and that's what they went with. Which, and in that case, you know, call me crazy. I'm not against that. If that's what the parents want, it's their daughter and the crime is a, a crime is a crime. It's black and white. If, if they committed the crime, do I think that the law enforcement might have taken some joy in that because of how they felt about Damien? I guess that's not for me to say, but you know, on paper, they, there may have been a crime committed. And if that's the case, well, then 
do the crime, you do the time, right? I guess that's how you want to look at it. I know not everyone will agree with that, but. So he was charged with burglary and sexual misconduct. So yeah, so yeah, so she's under, she's under the age of consent and I'm assuming he broke into the car. It was like a trailer, an abandoned like trailer. Abandoned in the fact that it was left there or abandoned the fact that nobody owned it. I think it was left there, but probably somebody still well, they, owned it. There yeah. you go. There you go. So you have this person, let's say it's me. They call me up because it's still registered to me. And they say, Derek, you have two people who broke into your trailer. They broke the lock or the window or whatever to get inside. They were sleeping in there. A little bit of damage to the door or whatever. What do you want to do? Well, I want to press charges. Well, then there you go. Now you have a complaint. Okay. So Damien claims that from the first moment he met Jerry Driver, the man was talking about Satanists, asking Damien if he'd heard anything around town about them. Jerry then pulled out Deanna's diary, and he told Damien that she was being held at a women's detention center because she had psychiatric troubles in the past. Damien would also be sent to a psychiatric center, but only after spending a week in the Craighead County Jail in May of 1992. I suppose that they did justify putting a 17-year-old in jail for a week because he had tried to run away with his 15-year-old girlfriend, but the report also states that Damien and Deanna had made a suicide pact and they'd both voiced suicidal ideations to people at the detention centers they were being held in. Now, like I said, while all of this was happening, these allegations are happening against his stepfather, Jack, and Damien's mother, Pam, removed her husband, Jack, from the home, even though she said she didn't believe Michelle's accusations about him. After Jack had moved out, Michelle tracked down her biological father, Joe Hutchinson, remember him? He was actually in Arkansas visiting family at the time, and... Joe and Pam like reunited and they began making plans to get back together. While Damien was in jail, he was given a psychiatric evaluation, but he said he didn't know it was a psychiatric evaluation at the time. Jerry Driver just brought him to this woman. She asked him some questions, showed him some flashcards, and then she looked at Jerry Driver and said simply, we have a bed for him. Jerry Driver told Damien's mother and father that a stay in a mental institution would be a better option than the alternative, which was nine months in jail. So on June 1st, 1992, Damien Eccles was admitted to Charter Hospital and he was prescribed antidepressants. Now, according to his intake report, while Damien had been in the detention center, he had told Jerry Driver that he and Deanna were trying to have a baby so that they could sacrifice it. This is something that Damien denied when asked about this at Charter. Damien told them that he was involved in witchcraft, not Satanism. Jerry Driver also claimed that Damien had chased a younger child with an axe and attempted to set a house on fire. Damien denied this as well. I would like to say that outside of Jerry Driver saying these two things, nobody else said this stuff. Nobody else said that Damien and Deanna claimed they were going to have a baby so they could sacrifice it. And nobody else said that Damien chased a younger kid with an axe. This was all from Jerry Driver. I agree with everything you said there, but I'll just say just because allegedly he only said it to Jerry Driver doesn't make it not true. Doesn't give it as much weight, but there is a world where he did say it. And why would Damien later say, oh, I didn't say that. So if I'm in a room with you, okay, we're on, we're talking and you say to me, hey, Derek, I killed this person, right? And I later dime you out and I tell them, hey, Stephanie told me she killed this person. Do you have mm -hmm. any proof of it? No. Do you have a recording of it? No. Do you have anything to, to show that other than what you're telling us that she actually said it? No. So they go to you and they say, Stephanie, did you tell Derek that you killed this person? And you're like, no, nope, absolutely not. <laughs> I didn't kill him. What do you, he's crazy. Now that may be the case here where he didn't say it to Jerry Driver, maybe based on past things that you've talked about throughout this episode, we're more likely to believe that it wasn't said. But I will just say, just to put it out there to try to stay impartial, I don't expect Damien to admit, yeah, I told them that I had wanted to sacrifice a child, especially when he knows what he's being looked at. Yeah, but why would you expect him to say it to Jerry Driver if he knew it was wrong and he wouldn't admit it later? Yeah, so that's the thing. I've had people while in custody or while talking to them, not in the right state of mind, they're flustered, they say something, and it may not even be true, but I've had them say things to me that they've later redacted. I've had that happen from both suspects and witnesses 
where in the moment you have a witness tell you something, confide in you about something their significant other or someone did, did to them. And then we go to court and I've been under oath and they have been under oath and under oath, they tell the, the judge or the lawyer, I didn't say that to officer Lavasser. You never said to him that, that he kicked you in the ribs. No, I absolutely didn't. And unfortunately we didn't have body cams. So it's my word against theirs. I'm only putting it out there from my anecdotal experience. I'm not saying it says either way that this is true. I just feel it's, it's important for me to mention that there Jerry driver could be saying the truth. I don't know the context in which Damien would say this in the first place. I'm with you there, but we really don't know. Dude, there's no context to where anybody would say that, especially yeah. when this dude's asking you about Satanism right off the bat. Like, do you know if there's any Satanism? Well, I don't know if there's any Satanism, but I will tell you, me and my girlfriend, were planning to have a baby so we could sacrifice it. Like, come on. <laughs> I agree with you. I wouldn't expect it. I don't. I wasn't there. I wouldn't expect him to say that, especially with what we're talking about now. But obviously, at the time when this would have been said, the murders hadn't happened yet. He like, might be more willing to say something like, that. I don't know. Or maybe he's, you know, like, let's say he did say it. Do we think he said it seriously or do we think he said it? Because like this dude's asking about Satanism and he's like, let me exactly. just fuck with this guy. Yeah, like, exactly. Who would say it and actually mean it? Mean it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm with you. And, that, and I'm not I'm not sitting here trying to convince you or anybody else. Otherwise, I'm just saying, is it possible he did say it? Yeah. The tone and context in which he said it in. Well, that's a whole different story. All right, so this next thing, though, is not a Jerry Driver allegation. Apparently, when he was in one of these, like, holding centers, another patient, like, cut his arm or something, and he was bleeding, and Damien, like, grabbed his arm and, like, like licked the blood. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, that's weird. And this is someone, again, this is before the murders. So this Yeah, isn't... a year before. But, like, also, Angelina Jolie and Billy Bob Thornton wore vials of each other's blood around their necks for, like, years and talked about how they, like— drank each other's blood during sex so nobody thought they were out there like sacrificing eight-year-olds to satan it's you know it's just would like would you be surprised if they were though yeah yes well, now, <laughs> i mean i mean if, if you learned that the people that were carrying vials of each other's blood around were later implicated in a some type of act would you be like no, oh yeah didn't see that coming no not not yes if it was happening today but like you don't understand that time man like everybody was into that weird shit <laughs> like licking other people's blood that you didn't know their wrists and shit that that's normal no it's not normal but he was in like a psychiatric facility man he was like you know disturbed and like messed up like and he wanted to be different and he always wanted to stand out and he wanted everyone to know, like, I'm not like other boys. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's weird for sure. Like, I'm not going to lie. I mean, we could sit here and go back and forth on this one as far as. Yeah. Now, during his stay at the hospital, he was described as staring into space and exhibiting no emotional response to any kind of stimuli. That's called dissociation. Once again, very common. He was paranoid and he didn't like the idea that cameras were watching him. And he drew witchcraft symbols and spoke of bizarre and unusual practices. One note says that Damien would make a sound with his mouth that sounded like the purr of a cat. Damien remained at Charter Hospital until June 25th, 1992, at which point he was released and he ended up moving with his family to Oregon, where he began working with his father, Joe, at a gas station. But for two days at the start of September 1992, apparently Damien was held at St. Vincent's Hospital in Portland due to a fight with his father. Joe Hutchinson would later give a statement about this saying, quote, while we were in Oregon, Michael got really sad like the time when we were driving up there. One day he locked himself up in a closet and had taken something in there with him. His grandmother told me that Michael had a knife. I thought that this was really serious and Pam and I made him go to a hospital in Oregon. Michael got really upset with me and I lost my temper and after I yelled at him, he got even more upset. I feel bad about this whole incident because what started it was Michael's grandmother saying he had a knife. I do not know why I immediately trusted her instead of checking it out. But what I found out later was that Michael may have just had a spoon with him, end quote. So Jerry Driver claimed something completely different happened during this interaction. He said that at the time of the incident, he'd spoken to Damien's parents and they claimed that Damien had tried to kill his father and he threatened to kill both his mother and father and that he was going to eat them alive. And in his book, 
Damien says like, yeah, I told my father like I'd eat you alive, you know, because he was like yelling at me and I didn't have a knife and like I was getting accused of something I didn't do and I was being like forced to go to a psychiatric hospital again when I just felt like I just got out of one and I shouldn't have been there in the first place. And then he was like making me feel like crap. And so I was like, I'll eat you alive. You know, I wasn't like, I'm going to cook you and eat you. (laughs) So (laughs) that's that. Well, maybe he wasn't going to cook them. Maybe you're just going to eat them alive. Just eat. Well, I mean, yeah, you wouldn't be cooking them That's if right. you're eating them alive, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Check mark for Derek there. Point. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so even though Damien would, was hundreds of miles away from West Memphis in uh, Portland, Jerry Driver could just not forget about him. He couldn't let Damien go. And he immediately contacted juvenile authorities in Oregon and asked that as long as Damien was on probation, they should have him under supervision. So one of the counselors in Oregon, Calvin Downey, he said that when Jerry Driver had given him Damien's name to look into, Driver had made the following comments. One, Damien and several of his associates were involved with a satanic cult. Two, Damien claims that he's a witch. Three, Damien and his girlfriend Deanna were planning to have a child so they could sacrifice it to Satan. And finally, the Arkansas authorities also believed that Damien's parents were involved in the satanic belief system. So when Downey, uh, he visited with Damien and his family, he wrote in his report, you know, Damien seems pretty normal. Like Damien's working with his father. He's making $5 an hour. He's not enrolled in school. He had no hobbies. He had no fun. He was just pretty much working. He's kind of like a melancholy kid. Among other things that seemed to be in limbo at that time, though, was Damien's name, which once again, he had changed when he'd been adopted by Jack Eccles. And also he was converting to the Catholic faith and he took that name of the saint that he admired. But he said now he was in the process of having his name legally changed again back to Michael Damien Wayne Hutchison. So he's adding Damien as a middle name, but he's going back to his original birth name. And apparently during that time where he was in Oregon, Damien was going by the name Michael with his family, with his work colleagues, which is why we saw his father, Joe, refer to him as Michael in that statement. When Calvin Downey asked Damien about Jerry Driver's claims of Satanism, Damien denied being involved, and Downey wrote, quote, He expressed considerable displeasure with Mr. Driver in making such assertions. Damien did acknowledge a suicide pact that he and his girlfriend had made if the authorities or her parents tried to keep them apart. However, he indicates that, following hospitalization, he's no longer interested in hurting himself or anyone else. Damien denies ever making threats of killing his girlfriend's parents. Damien acknowledges that he is a witch and indicates that it is his religious preference. He also distinguishes his religious beliefs from Satanism, indicating that he believes in a series of gods and goddesses, and he sees this as his religious preference that should not be the concern of state authorities. Damien felt that my inquiries in this area were an intrusion into his privacy and declined to discuss matters further, end quote. Oh, yeah. So Jerry Driver claimed that not only did Damien threaten to kill his own parents, but he threatened to kill Deanna's parents. And Damien said, like, yeah, when he was in the back of the car, the cop car, when they got arrested outside the trailer, he saw Deanna's father, like, yelling at Deanna. And Damien said, I'll kill him if he hurts her, you know. But once again, this is it. Like, a lot of this stuff's taken out of context, man. Just in Crime Weekly News today, I said that if any teacher touched my child in a sexual manner, that they wouldn't have to worry about prison because I would kill them. You know, it's like just something people say. But did you not mean that when you said it? I mean, do I think that if it came down to it, I would have it in me to take a human life? Probably not. No. I would okay. want to, right? But, mm-hmm. like, can I kill someone? No, I can't even kill a bug. I, I like chase down bugs and let them out of my house because I don't want to kill them. So no, probably not like actually capable of killing somebody. But like, is there a rage when you see somebody you love hurt and you feel like the the thing you want to do, especially when you're not like, um, you know, I'm not like an emotional person and I'm not like in charge of my emotions. The only productive emotion I feel that I can have is anger. So everything turns into anger, you know? And I think Damien also kind of went through that, too. Like, he just didn't have normal, typical emotional coping mechanisms. Yeah. As I do not. Always went to the extreme. Always goes to the extreme. That's what I do. So, like, I get it. But I'm also probably not going to go out there and kill anybody. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not, I'm definitely not going to. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said probably. <laughs> so suspicious. Yeah. So he he got accused of trying to you know threatening to kill his girlfriend's parents too, and he explains this. And I guess what once again, it's all what you believe. But what I will tell you is, if he threatened to kill his parents and Deanna's parents, none of those people ended up dying. So. If we're really concerned about threats that he's making, don't you think that those people would be dead in the woods instead Mm. of three random eight-year-old boys that Damien didn't even know? Never even attempted it. So it was decided that Damien would remain under a minimum amount of supervision until he turned 18, which was four months later. But two days after this visit, the Oregon officials got another letter from Jerry Driver claiming that Damien was trying to get in touch with Deanna, which was a violation of his probation. And he was. He was calling her and he was like, you know, do you miss me? And... This, this and that. She's like, yeah, but she couldn't talk. You know, so she he was like he loved her. So why is Jerry Driver in Arkansas so committed to making sure that Damien's life is still miserable in Oregon, like completely opposite ends of the country? It seems like you've got an obsession here, my dude. Well, I maybe her parents, Deanna's parents reached out. And they filed a complaint. Yeah, but you're, why are you like messaging the juvenile probation department there? He's not on probation in Oregon. He's on probation in Arkansas. You're messaging them and saying like, as a courtesy, you need to like watch him because he's into Satanism and this, this and that. Like there was no professional reason for Jerry Driver to do that other than like you're obsessed with this kid and you're sure he's like a devil worshiper and you think like wherever he's going to go, he's going to be worshiping the devil. And he definitely had he had it out for, for there's no there's no doubt about it that he had a, he had a hard on for for Damien. And you see cops like that where there's just that one guy that they just think is a bad is a bad egg and they're just they're just they, yeah, they can't let it go. So Damien goes to St. Vincent Hospital for two days and the therapist there found him to be a bit depressed. And he said, yes, I am depressed because I miss my girlfriend, Deanna, and my best friend, Jason. And they also found him to be very smart. You know, he wasn't great in math, but he was very good at reading and writing. And one examiner said that Damien's use of language was at a very high level and it was beautiful in quality, even though it had a morbid appeal to it. And so, I mean, he was released after two days. They were like, what What are you doing here? We're not really sure. We don't have any reason to keep you here. You're not a, a risk to yourself or others. Now, reportedly, it was kind of a mutual thing that Damien's parents didn't want him to come back home and he didn't want to go back home. Um, it's reported that they believed he was dangerous to them and to other children in their home. That was that was in the book, The Case Against the West Memphis Three. I could not find that said anywhere else. I looked through some interviews from his parents and I couldn't find the, the place where they said that. But that doesn't mean that they didn't say that. It just means I couldn't find it at that time. And Damien expressed his intentions to move back to West Memphis where he would live with his stepfather, Jack Eccles. And the folks at St. Vincent saw no issue with this. They wrote that Damien's plans to become emancipated and returned to Arkansas seemed reasonable. St. Vincent's passed this information on to the Oregon juvenile officials and they passed it on to Jerry Driver, who was livid. He wrote a letter saying that Damien returning to West Memphis would be a violation of his probation. And Oregon authorities didn't pay Jerry Driver any mind. And so Damien boarded a bus to Arkansas. And when he arrived, he immediately hooked up with his old friends, Dominique Tier and Jason Baldwin. And they had a fun few days until Jerry Driver knocked on his door and hauled him away. Basically, Damien says that Jerry Driver was like, you're under arrest. And then Damien was adjudicated as a juvenile and brought back to the Crittenden County Jail. I'm not sure why. Maybe because he was in violation of his probation. Maybe because he had tried to contact Deanna. And when he came back to Arkansas, Jerry Driver and the West Memphis police had, you know, some stake in it all of a sudden. I don't know. But once he was back at the county jail, Damien said, quote, this time Driver's questions became even more bizarre and outrageous. I was taken into a small office and chained to a chair while he and another guy tried to entice me to read texts to them that were written in Latin. He showed me odd objects that I'd never seen before, such as glass pyramids and silver rings with strange designs. He wanted me to explain the significance of these items to him. I had not the slightest clue what any of it meant, but he refused to accept that answer. 
When he was finished with this, I was left in a jail cell for a few more weeks. End quote. Jerry Driver also had Damien hospitalized again for a short time, and even the doctors there seem to have no idea why Damien is patient. And his medical record is public because it was part of the trial, so I you were able to read through the whole thing. And you can see, like, one of the doctors is like, I don't really understand why he's here. He's super intelligent. He's got a huge vocabulary, especially without having a traditional education. He has a way with words. He has a strong ability to express himself through writing. Was Damien a little bit withdrawn and angry? Yes. But this doctor was like, who would really expect him to be much different considering what he's been through in his life? Like, we don't really expect him to be completely well adjusted and settled at this point. But he's intelligent. He seems to be in touch with his emotions because he writes in his journal. He's always talking about how he's feeling. And we don't really know why he's here. <laughs> so Damien lived with his stepfather, Jack Eccles. He gave himself an education. He got his GED and he continued to see Jerry Driver once a week, at which times he says that Jerry and Steve Jones would grill him about the occult. And according to Damien, Jerry and Steve were busy spreading rumors about him around town. He said one day he and Jason were watching TV in Jack's trailer when a kid named Bo stopped over and said that Jerry Driver was asking questions about Damien at the corner store. And Driver had told everyone there to keep their distance from Damien because he was going down and anyone he was close to or with would be going down too. Now, when Damien turned 18, he said the only thing he was happy about was that he would no longer be under the purview of Jerry Driver, a man who seemed hell-bent on finding any way to get Damien behind bars for the rest of his life. And I personally have often wondered if this transition from childhood to, like, legal adulthood made Jerry Driver feel a bit panicked, you know, like he was racing a clock, like he was running out of chances to prove that Damien was a bad seed because he wasn't in charge of him anymore. And did this lead to desperation? Desperation to either, I don't know, formulate a plan that would once and for all get Damien off the streets of West Memphis or to find any way to tie Damien to a crime that happened in order to get him off the streets of West Memphis and out of their lives forever. There's no doubt you've laid out a pattern of behavior that su suggests a relationship between Jerry Driver and Damien Eccles that was obviously not professional at times. There was definitely uh, an interest, a fascination with with Damien Eccles on the, on the part of Jerry Driver. Now, I'm going to go out and say, although there's some things that Damien did that I think a lot of kids would do, I also do think there are some things that were not okay and are not warranted are not justified and I'm not condoning them. I think Damien, regardless of his childhood, which we discussed, there are many kids who have similar childhoods and don't do some of the things that Damien did. Like what? I don't think running away with your 15 year old girlfriend, breaking into a trailer, having sex with her when she's underage is a normal thing that most boys do. I don't. Now I'm not saying he's a killer for that. That's but not true. It's a crime. So if you think that most guys... I mean, when they met, she was 15 and he was 16. He turned 17 while she was still 15. But like, come on. I'm not they, saying it they doesn't had been happen. Dating for, they'd been dating for a year. Like there are, there should be preclusions to that. Like that's Romeo and juliet -ed. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. And I'm not saying it doesn't happen more than just a couple with a couple kids. But I do, th I don't think that's the norm. Okay, I, I don't else? think, um, I don't think breaking into a trailer that you don't own is right. I don't think threatening parents to kill them is normal i don't mm -hmm. think making a pact to kill each yourselves if you can't be together is is something that should be definitely so, i agree so, with that. so there's definitely things in there that i think are s situations that as from law enforcement and from a government perspective where you're in this role of juvenile probation etc they're things that you should be aware of do i think jerry had it out for for damien absolutely do i think his fascination with him to go out to the lengths of making professional quote unquote professional courtesy calls to other states. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be doing that. I do think once Damien violated probation, although it's not an extraditable thing, would I maybe give a professional courtesy to that agency to let them know about it? Yeah, maybe at that point, but I don't think I'm giving a preempt preemptive heads up to that agency that there's someone in my town that I need to watch. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm doing that. That's probably, I'm not probably not going to that length, but I do think there are things. You would if you, if you genuinely believed he was like a double a bad guy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if right. I do think he's a bad guy. So, and that's what I'm saying. I think Jerry in his mind definitely thought that. And 
So I don't know if I would do it. I think he was coming from a place where he's like, this guy is a bad dude. And it's only a matter of time before he seriously hurts someone. That's mm-hmm. what I think he was thinking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I see that. But here's the thing. He's being preemptive. He's being proactive, if you want to call it that. He hasn't actually done it yet, as we've noted in the episode. There's really no serious crimes of violence here. There's threats of it, but there's no actual serious crimes of violence. It definitely, there's a pattern here where, and even Damien admitted it, where there were some mental things going on where he did need professional help to get through that. So those th- that is the good side of it, where he was, those issues were addressed and there may have been some residual effects from it. He knew that it was it was he was not allowed to contact his girlfriend and yet he still was afterwards so there are things that he was doing that he's a freaking teenage boy who's like raging hormones and that's what i'm going to ask you like yes breaking into the trailer running away even the suicide pact you know is that like to you if you had two columns and one column was like murders and tortures three eight-year-olds or you know slightly disturbed not well adjusted emotionally teenage boy who's not super in control of his emotions and his impulses where are those things going to like fall more probably to the column of like emotionally disturbed 17 year old boy who's not in control of his impulses that running away um the suicide pact it's dramatic man don't you remember being in high school weren't you dramatic in high school probably not you're so like even keeled you're probably so such a boring teenager I don't I don't normally go into like my past. I mean, I talked about it in my book. I know you said you had a bad past. Mine's documented uh, through school. Not good. I uh, got assigned to multiple grades. Uh, didn't get to graduate uh, my junior my junior year with everyone else because of a fight I got in at the end of the year that involved a knife, not a knife on my part. So I had a path, a uh, lot of fights. I got a I had a path where I could be behind bars or go after the people that were needed to be there. And I chose that path, but that's a different story, different day. I don't think some of the things he did from my perception were things that were being done by my friends or, or me again, does it make him a murderer? Now that all the being the case, if something like this happened in my town and I was an investigator would, and, and I'm looking at someone, would he be someone I may look into a, a, on a list of a lot of people? Of course, of course, especially when he's admitting that he's practices certain things like this i'm not saying that the things he practices insinuate he would kill a little child but it would be a reason for maybe why he would have been in the woods at that time do you see how i'm linking it as opposed to maybe he was there with his friends practicing that yes so that's something wiccans worship nature they don't kill little children right so i would and I'm not saying they do, but I would look into it and you wouldn't be doing your job if you didn't. Now, where they were, again, we still have a lot to go, but where the problem persists is that looking into that person and then trying to find a way to link them to it, even if there's nothing there. And that's what we really got to get into because I really want to, we talked about a lot of background stuff tonight. Yeah. And yeah, well, that we is had part to. of I feel like we had to. Yeah. No, that's part of the equation, yeah. right? Like it's part of the story, but I think what really matters is going to be the evidence in the case, right? Okay. Where yeah. where is the connection to Damien and these little boys? Now you may there may be none. I don't know. But there's I, no that, freaking evidence. There's no freaking evidence. There's no physical evidence tying yeah. any of these three teenage boys to these three eight year old boys. That's like therein lies the crux. So like let's have an episode about the evidence. It's blank. It's a blank episode. Is well, how like, did, didn't two juries convict him of this of the crime? I don't know the case specifically, but I didn't didn't two different juries both find them guilty of listen, this? We're gonna we're gonna talk about it. Okay, I want to talk about it because I'm assuming it's a circumstantial case, and yeah. you know the same argument could be they made. They brought for in Adnan. a freaking expert of the occult to testify. I'll just say that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 open minded. I'm open minded okay. to it. I know that we're in a point right now where these gentlemen are free. And that's that's something that I have to be I'm aware of, obviously, but I'm I'm looking at it episode by episode. And I want to hear the circumstantial evidence surrounding this case that led two juries to convict them of murder. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get there as well. It doesn't really matter if I do or not. I have no no skin in the game with the case, but I'll be honest with you guys. If I don't if I think they were wrong, I'll say they were wrong. If I think they were right, I'll say they were right. Like I said, Adnan Syed, his case is let's be honest, it's mostly circumstantial. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of people saying comments, but then there's a lot of people disputing those witness testimony, that this testimony and phone, it's all circumstantial. But we both have said that even though it's circumstantial, 
it's more likely than not that he might have been involved, right? Yeah, we said it's it's circumstantial and he probably should not have been put on trial with that evidence. However, there are things that make us feel that he was at the very least involved. So let's see if that's the case here. Now, you're tell- yeah. the way you're talking, it sounds like there may not be, but that's what I'm saying. Just because there's no DNA at the scene or any, I want to see what we have because in totality, I may feel differently than than most people. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, maybe. I mean- We'll see. We'll go through it. We'll go through it. And now I have to go to bed. All right. Now it was a great. It was a great episode. I'm glad we get the background. We kind of know in the foundation of where Jerry Driver comes from, as far as now we're caught up to the murders. And his first thought is, it's got to be Damian Eccles and his crew. Okay. Now we understand. Where, we may not agree with it, but we know where that came from. We know the foundation of where that thought process was derived from. So it's important. No final words. I'm assuming you're ready to go to bed. <laughs> I am so ready to go to bed. (laughs) Okay, real quick. And this is at the end of the episode. We didn't do it at the beginning, but I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that right now, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on audio, Stephanie is rocking the Criminal Coffee sweatshirt. Pre-orders are now filled by this point. If you pre-ordered, you should have your merch. You should have your gear. Make sure you're tagging us both on Crime Weekly Pod, uh, which is our Instagram, and also Drink Criminal Coffee, which is our Instagram for Criminal Coffee. If you're ordering now, there will be no holdover. As soon as you order it, Within a few days, if the stuff is in stock, you'll have it. Um, You can go check out our website, criminalcoffeeco.com. As always, we appreciate you joining us here. Stay safe out there. We will see you next week. Bye.